a.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of November 9th, 2021 is called to order. The first item on the agenda is the approval of agenda in order of priority. Are there any items board members would like to add or delete from the agenda? Hearing none, may I please have a motion to approve the agenda and order of priority? I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, if I could have a roll call vote, please, Marilyn. Yes. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Tilly's muted. Yes. Thank you. Motion, or Albrich absent. Motion carries. Thank you. At this time, Marilyn Schneider, our State Board Executive, will introduce the members of the State Board of Education. Happy to do so. You've just been listening to Dr. Michael Rice. He is the State Superintendent and Chair of the Board. And as we go around the table, Dr. Cassandra Albrich is the Board's President. She is unable to join us today. She's absent. Dr. Pamela Pugh is the Vice President of the Board from Saginaw. She's present in the room. Ms. Tiffany Tilly is secretary from Southfield. She is joining us virtually, which is allowed by the Open Meetings Act for a medical condition. She is able to participate and vote. Ms. Nikki Snyder is the board's legislative committee member. She's from Dexter. She is physically present in the room. Ms. Ellen Cogen Lipton is chair of the board's legislative committee. She's from Huntington Woods. She is joining us virtually by reason of a medical condition, which is allowed by the Open Meetings Act. Ms. Leah Porter is our 2021-22 Teacher of the Year, Michigan Teacher of the Year. When she's not here, she's a third grade teacher at Wilcox Elementary School in Holt Public Schools. If we go across the table, the, that seat is the governor's seat. Ms. Patty Redinger represents the governor, and she's joining us virtually. Ms. Redinger is the Governor's Director of Federal Affairs. That's an ex officio seat. Dr. Judith Pritchett is in the room. She's the board's association delegate, the NASB delegate, National Association of State Boards of Education. And she's a board, on the board legislative committee and she resides in Washington Township. Next to her, physically present in the room, Mr. Jason Strayhorn. He's on the board's legislative committee and he's from Novi. Next to me and Mrs. Mr. Strayhorn is Mr. Tom McMillan. He's the board's treasurer. He's from Oakland Township, physically present in the room. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, the public may provide comments during the public participation portion of the meeting at approximately 1 p.m. Public comments will be accepted from those in person and online who register before 1 p.m. today. If you wish to offer public comment online during the meeting, please send an email to schneidermm at michigan.gov. Provide your name, city, and telephone number from which you will be calling. You will receive an email with the call-in number and conference ID to provide public comment in person. Please complete a public comment form when you arrive here at the meeting location. These instructions are listed on the MDE webpage at www.michigan.gov backslash MDE. The first item on the Committee of the Whole agenda today is educational updates related to COVID-19. Today we welcome virtually Dr. Natasha Bagdasarian, Chief Medical Executive, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Bagdasarian is joining us online to share updates related to COVID-19. This is an informational presentation and no board action is required. Dr. Bagdasarian, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, it's an absolute honor to be here. And I would just like to start out by thanking everyone for the hard work that they're doing um, in the space of education. I know that these are challenging times. Um, and so I just really thank you for your partnership um, and thank you for all the work that happens in this space. I'm hoping that I can share my slides. I just have a few slides uh, to share with you. And can everyone see my slides okay? Yes. Wonderful. 
I thought I would give a brief update on where we are with the COVID-19 situation around the state. Um, and of course, this does pertain to the health of children as well. The first slide I'm showing is our case rate, um, and I'm showing the um, the entire pandemic here um, from the early days on just to show how different this surge looks in relation to previous surges. Um, what we're seeing is that this has been a very steady and slow incline rather than that very sharp uptake of cases that we've seen previously um, and likely related to the vaccine status of much of our state. I'd also like to point out this area at the far right of the curve, um, we had reached a point where we thought we had plateaued, potentially even we're seeing a dip in cases. Um, and that does not appear to be the case with data from the last few days. Um, but only, only time will tell. Some of this data is lagging. The next slide I'm showing is um, an overview of where we are this year compared to last year. And the, the blue or teal curve shows where we were last year with our holiday wave of cases. Um, so you can compare that with the orange curve, which is where we are now. And what we're really seeing is that we are um, far higher at this point in 2021 than we were in 2020. And it's concerning because we're starting to move into holiday season, people gathering together, um, and viral respiratory season. So um, watching this again very carefully, this, um, this slide that I'm showing doesn't have our latest data, so it doesn't show that little um, uptick of cases. Next, I'm showing our positivity rate. So this really shows how many people are testing positive out of all of those testing. This number is best um, when it's low. So we like to see this number less than five or less than 3%. Currently, we're at 12.7% overall, but much higher in certain parts of the state, as high as 17 and even 20%. So this means that we, um, we need to encourage testing in as many places as possible. It means that we are most likely missing cases of COVID. Our hospitalization rate uh, here is where we are compared to our previous surges. So things aren't as high as they were before, but the hospitals are definitely feeling some stress. And we're hearing um, from our partners in healthcare that they are not only facing um, healthcare personnel shortages, nursing shortages, but they're concerned about the strain this is placing on their facilities at this time. Uh, and this is the percent of inpatient beds that are filled with COVID patients. Again, the healthcare systems are feeling some strain. When we look at our deaths, the peak um, or what looked like a peak, again, this is lagging data, is not as high as some previous surges, which is reassuring and does tell us that um, number one, we've got folks vaccinated across the state and number two, we have therapeutics that are um, helping. This is a graph that looks specifically at our age groups and the start of school. And what we saw in our five to 18 year olds is we saw an uptick in cases um, right as schools were reopening and that's continued to go up. Again, this data does not contain our latest case rate data and we are continuing to see increases in cases in the five to 18 year old at this point in time. In terms of outbreaks, K through 12 schools are the biggest source of outbreaks across the state. With vaccinations, um, this number is, is being updated. Um, we are right around that 70% mark when we look at residents over the age of 16. Um, but we can see that there are still some um, discrepancies when we look at different demographics. So first, this is coverage by race, and you can see that there are some differences by race. Um, so when we look at vaccine initiation, um, we're looking at numbers that range from 38% to 56%. Again, we're watching this very carefully with an, with an equity lens here. And then when we look by age, this is where we see a very clear trend um, our older Michiganders, so those over the age of 65, have very high vaccine uptake. So we're looking at 86% in that age group for vaccine initiation. And when we compare that to our younger age group, so it steadily drops, 
And our 12 to 15 year olds, they're only at 42% for vaccine initiation. This is concerning because it's likely that we'll see a similar trend in five to 11 year olds. And, um, and as you can see, these numbers are quite low, um, although the, the true number of vaccines delivered is somewhere closer to about 8,000 um, at, at this point. That's all I have for you. Um, again, thank you for letting me join you today. Um, very happy to be able to share this data with you. And again, thank you so much for your continued efforts in this space. Thank you very much, Dr. Bagdasarian. Uh, <coughs> board member uh, comments or questions? Uh, Mr. McMillan. Yeah, uh, thank you for being here, doctor. Um, I saw the deaths are, are going down. Do you have uh, the deaths of the youth, you know, like K through 12 or under 17? Do you have that? data? I don't have that data with me today. We know that the deaths are occurring predominantly in older age groups. That's something we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic and something we've seen nationally and internationally. However, there are still severe cases in our younger population as well. We do have cases of MISC um, and still a cause for concern in that younger age group. Yeah, I just, uh, it'd be helpful because I understand that those deaths are less than the deaths of um, children, uh, children dying in accidents in Michigan and car accidents. So I just, uh, relative risk I think is important. Uh, do you, is there any data on deaths of youth soon after getting a vaccine? So as you know, there's a very robust um, adverse events reporting system in place. And um, when the five to 11 year old age group was studied, so this was um, the recent trials, that allowed for approval of the five to 11 year old age group, there were no serious adverse events. Okay. So including myocarditis or, or death, um, which, is, which is reassuring for that age group. I completely um, understand where you're coming from. I will say that national data um, suggests that COVID-19 is in the top 10 causes of deaths in that pediatric age group. So um, I do understand that there are things that are, um, more deadly to children. However, it's still one of the top 10 causes of death. Okay. And thank you so much for your question. I, I yeah, appreciate Yeah, the myocarditis. That. I, I had, so the, the young man who died, the young boy who died uh, in the Saginaw area did not die, uh, who had recently had a vaccine that was not myocarditis like I had heard? I'm unable to comment on any specific cases, um, but of course the data is being looked at very closely and of the clinical trials with 3,000 children ages 5 to 11, there were no cases of myocarditis. Oh, just 3,000. That's pretty small. And it's obviously not a very long term. It was very short term. Uh, as far as the outbreaks, I, as I understand it, outbreaks are counted at schools if only two kids um, are, have uh, COVID, you know, and it was one gave it to the other. So it, it could be just simply two, as I understand it. Is that correct? So the outbreak definition was recently updated so that if you're looking at very small groups, it could be just 10% of that um, of that group. So it's possible that an outbreak could be classified as two individuals, yes. Okay, and then finally, um, I understand that uh, people that go to the hospital um, after one dose, but not the second, they're considered to be there as unvaccinated. Is that correct? I think what you might be referring to is when we look at some of our data, we look at those who are considered fully vaccinated versus those who are not fully vaccinated. So that's for some types of um, data breakdown. Well, no, but I, I understand that a good portion of the people that are actually at the hospitals uh, may very well be after one dose and not the second. And they're you know, the, the rhetoric is that, you know, unvaccinated are filling hospitals, or that was at least at one point. Uh, but I understand that a good portion of those uh, were one dose uh, people. So um, I, I um, completely see where you're coming from. And, and I understand, yes, if you've received one dose, you're not considered fully vaccinated. And so when we look at that data, when we look at percent of um, hospitalizations, um, with COVID among those who are fully vaccinated versus not. If you had one dose, you would not be considered fully vaccinated. But I do just want to clarify a little bit because I think that um, this is 
um, a tricky point with the data. One of the things that um, if you look through our data deck, you will see is that there are um, what are considered cases of breakthrough vaccination. So those are vaccination in people who have received um, two or more, do more doses. That percentage is expected to go up as more people are vaccinated. So if you could imagine a scenario where 100% of folks are vaccinated, then all of our cases would be breakthrough cases because everyone would be vaccinated. So that trend, if, if that's what you're alluding to, um, would be an expected trend, but still those who are unvaccinated or who have not completed vaccination are far overrepresented in our COVID-19 hospitalizations. And then my last question actually is the Israeli study that uh, took 2.5 million people showed, and Dr. Rand Paul uh, mentioned it, uh, showed that um, those with natural immunity uh, because they had COVID were seven times uh, more protected from uh, COVID than those who got the vaccine, uh, even the second dose. And I, I looked at the CDC's refutation of that and they didn't actually refute it. They just said that, you know, somebody who's seven times, if they get the vaccine, they could be 10 times, you know? So kind of like if you have one mask, if you put four masks on, you've got even more protection. It's, you know, so I, I just wanted, do, are you familiar with the Israeli study? Uh, you know, clearly the most profound and largest of ever, you know, ever uh, on this COVID uh, situation and vaccine versus natural immunity. Does do, am, am I reading it right? And are the vast you know majority of or, or l large numbers of doctors and medical professionals reading it correctly and saying that natural immunity is far has has far more protection than uh, full fully vaccinated people? Um, you know, not I, I don't want to play with words. Perhaps if they got vaccinated, they would be you know we can add a few decimal point uh, a few zeros after the decimal point, but uh, they are many times more protected from COVID than uh, the vaccinated people. So really excellent question. Um, and it sounds like you've been really doing your homework. So thank you for that. Um, the specifics of that study, um, I, I'd love it if you could send me that study again so I could take a look at it. But one of the things that we see across the board when looking at these types of studies is that it's very difficult to determine um, the degree of protection from from what we're calling natural immunity or from exposure. And it's simply because it is so variable across the board. The other, the other part that gets very tricky is that when we're looking at antibody levels, there is a difference between antibody and neutralizing antibody. And not just that, but antibodies are not the only part of the immune response that is related to producing a long-lasting immunity. So while there is no long-term data on any of this, because COVID-19 has only been around for two years um, or less than two years, what we're really seeing is that for the most durable and consistent immunity, vaccines are shown to be more have been shown to be superior than exposure and again it has to do with variability and it has to do with the fact that an individual immune response to an exposure um, is so hard to predict as opposed to vaccine which is uh, a much more uh, consistent um, and um, and regulated exposure so you know exactly what the body is seeing and exactly what the body is reacting to. Um, so I think more data will emerge and we'll continue to look at all of it, but really an excellent question. And I'll take a look at that study again. And, and thank you for, for raising you, those important points. Can you send me points. your study? Because I don't, I have not heard that uh, as far as anything that's, uh, you know, peer reviewed or, or, you know, has any credibility. So if you could send me whatever backs up your claim, that'd be great. Oh, I would love to. Yep, we've Thank got you. lots of data on that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bagdasarian. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Other questions or uh, comments from board members? Questions or comments, Dr. Pugh. Thank you, um, Dr. Bagdasarian, for uh, your service and for coming. Um, and I am happy to know that you and your family uh, are well after um, healing from COVID. Um, my first question is, do you have any of the data that's on MISC? I know you mentioned it. Do you have any of the data? I don't know how long that data lags. I've seen data from uh, 
it, it seems like it, it lags and then there's more data that's put in uh, uh, and backdated. So I don't know if you have any of the MISC data um, as it relates to the trends that you showed today. I don't have MISC data on hand, but I'm, I can certainly pull some up and I'm happy to share it. Um, I can I can email it to Dr. Rice after. And just um, from your experiences, I guess if you can talk about um, MISC and, and what that means for, for children uh, in the state across the country. Yes, I'm happy to talk about this. Um, MISC is really an inflammatory response to this virus. This is a novel virus, and there are some children who have um, a more than robust inflammatory response that is not helpful to the body. So what we're talking about is a COVID infection um, following an exposure and children who tend to actually have milder illness initially. Um, and then, you know, weeks later, there's the potential for, um, again, fever and multi-system involvement. And there are children who um, end up hospitalized from this, who end up on uh, in, in ICUs from this, and there have even um, been deaths. So it's, um, it's very concerning because while we think about this as being a mild disease in children across the board, we just don't know who is going to have a severe disease or um, which children are likely to have these very, um, very serious and adverse outcomes. One of the things that I talk about with my colleagues across the state who are pediatricians and who are working in pediatric ICUs is that if... Um, if one were to walk through a pediatric ICU right now, um, there would be no debate. We were, we would all sort of double down on mitigation measures um, because the um, the sight of previously healthy children who are suffering these terrible consequences is is truly um, hard to see. Thank you. Thank you. And just a question: Do now children who have who are counted as having recovered from or having had MISC that are counted in the databases? Do that, those include children who have long haul disease or have long haul effects? Those are two separate things. So um, you know, long symptoms are a separate category, and again, something that we're very concerned about. Um, so there are the long lasting consequences of COVID and then there are the acute serious detrimental um, causes that cause, you know, that lead to hospitalizations for prolonged periods of time and, and um, bad outcomes in the short term. And do we collect that data? Is that data recorded somewhere? That data is a little bit more difficult to collect, but there are ongoing studies at the national level, and this is something that the CDC is looking at and partnering with states on. Um, so I don't have um, data for Michigan at the moment, but as time goes on, I think that given the CDC's efforts and some of the partnerships and some of the collaboration, there should be some, um, some data that I can share. Do we collect data on children who have been orphaned uh, as a result of COVID? I was looking at a CDC study or publication from October where it was saying one U.S. child loses a parent or caregiver for every four COVID-19 associated deaths. That's a new model. And it talked about um, American Indian, Alaskan Native children being 4.8. 4.5 times more likely to lose a parent or a grandparent caregiver, black children 2.4 times, and Hispanic Latino children two times a greater. Do we have any information, do we collect information here on children who have been orphaned as a result of, of COVID? Dr. Pugh, I think that also is data that's harder to collect and it's a little bit more tenuous. But yes, there are national um, studies and there is national modeling looking at this, um, looking at the number of children who've been orphaned due to COVID. And I think you bring up a really important point. The consequences of COVID-19 are so um, diverse and can go from anywhere from missing school, which I think um, can be can be um, a, a bad outcome for some children, missing significant amounts of school, either due to illness or quarantine, to having long haul symptoms, 
to having a severe medical outcome to losing a parent or to even losing their life. So I think um, very important points and thank you for bringing that up. And I'm happy that you you got that. You know, I know that you uh, are a medical doctor as well as have a public health background. And one of the things that we uh, learn as we talk about um, relative risk or, or, or um, uh, 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 risk exposure, uh, the, all the things that we look at, you know, we have to go upstream and look at what are the upstream effects that end up um, causing our children to have um, lesser quality of life. Uh, and, you know, when I'm looking at a study, when I'm looking, just something as simple as, as parental loss, um, I'm looking at a study of World War I where it was predictive of a reduced lifespan in adulthood. So those are the things that, that I've learned to look at, um, is how all of these multiple cumulative impacts um, that can be attributed to COVID-19 and how we handle it and how we uh, as a country, as a people, um, continuously put our children in harm's way and prolong our recovery um, from this illness. Uh, so uh, you, you understand exactly um, where I'm going with that. Uh, so uh, I do want to point that out. Um, the other thing that I'll just ask I know that there has been um, this discussion around misinformation as a public health threat. I don't know if we've looked at that as a state. Um, and then the only other question that I will have is, um, I asked this question, I'll ask it again. You know, has anything changed? Who has the authority to put forward um, mitigation uh, strategies within schools and uh, has that has that uh, power or control left the hands of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services? Um, again, I'd like to thank you for bringing up all of these important points. I think that you brought up a really um, powerful um, point when you when you mentioned um, losing a parent and life expectancy because we know that childhood traumas can affect the overall health of an individual, not just in childhood, but long afterwards. So um, I, I'd like to just acknowledge that very important point. Um, I do want to say in terms of authority, um, as far as I know, nothing has changed in terms of the authority of MDHHS. We continue to recommend and encourage smart mask policies in schools, uh, which are areas where there are very low rates of vaccination in, um, in the five to 11 year old age group and low rates of vaccination in the 12 to 15 year old um, age group. So we continue to recommend these layered mitigation strategies and all the things we've been talking about since the beginning of the pandemic. So wearing a mask, distancing, ventilation, staying at home when you're ill, testing, all of these things are um, key. Um, and now we have a very important tool and that is vaccination for the five to 11 year old age group. So thank you. Absolutely, this, this is my last thing, uh, Please. Dr. Rice. And I, cause I just wanna make sure that, that you've seen because there, there is a petition from Michigan Parent Alliance for Safe Schools and it's, it's uh, probably upward of 10,000 uh, signatures and of, of parents who are asking for um, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to step up and do all that they can to protect our children as we go, especially, you know, as we go into these months that we don't know uh, what the outcome would be, help them protect themselves uh, uh, as well as uh, their parents and their teachers as we uh, continue to use the other mitigation strategies that you've listed. But again, I, I appreciate you uh, being here and your service. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Thank you, Dr. Bagdasari and Ms. Tilly. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Dr. Bagdasarian. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I asked Dr. Rice if we could have you give our COVID updates monthly, and I hope that you can join us every month because this is so important. As, as you can imagine, this has been the predominant topic here at our state board meetings. And there has been a lot of uh, misinformation and a lot of questions that we've had, and we've definitely needed your expertise. 
So thank you so much for joining us. Um, one question I do have is with asymptomatic carriers, are you seeing that a lot with children? Are are they um, are there a lot of asymptomatic cases where they are contracting the virus and then bringing bringing it home to their parents and family? Absolutely. Um, what a great question. I think that when we look at kids across the board and we when we look at how children respond to COVID-19 exposures, I had mentioned previously that, of course, there are severe outcomes and there are children who have life-threatening illness. But what we tend to see are mild illness and, and as you mentioned, asymptomatic cases. But even with those asymptomatic cases, there can still be transmission in schools, so transmission to other vulnerable classmates who may not have such a mild disease, and then, of course, bringing disease back into the household. And one of the things that we know, again, from very early on in the pandemic is that household transmission occurs very readily especially with the Delta variant. So when you're living in close quarters, you know, we're all doing a good job about masking when we're in big public spaces, but when you're living in close quarters and you're not wearing a mask at home, obviously, um, there can be much higher rates of transmission. And so if a child is exposed in school and has very minor symptoms or no symptoms at all, they can still bring that disease home to grandparents, to parents with um, underlying illnesses. And I think that's still one of, the, one of the big problems. One way to combat this is to have regular testing in places like schools um, and um, testing of those who are asymptomatic on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tilly, any other questions? Um, just, are you able to track it? Have you guys been tracking that? And do you know, do you have data on it? We do. Um, so one of the things that we did in the, um, in the winter of last year is we started out with a school testing pilot, and this was testing for athletes, um, for the winter postseason, um, uh, athletic competitions. And so we, we started with that group to see how testing would go in schools. And what we found is, yes, we were picking up asymptomatic cases. We were picking up asymptomatic cases in student athletes who would otherwise have gone on to participate in sports. And some of these sports, there's no masking. And so we, we picked up on um, what could have been transmission. Now, we then in the spring um, had a, a very robust testing program and there were about 80,000 um, K through 12 kids testing every week and reporting the results of those tests. And while the percent positivity was low, meaning you have to do a lot of testing to detect those positives, every time we detected a positive in someone who's asymptomatic, you're basically stopping transmission from happening. Because if people don't know that they have COVID, they're not gonna stop participating in all the things that they'd normally um, attend. So those, those asymptomatic cases we picked up on, I think were very important in preventing transmission. We are still sending um, testing supplies to schools who want them this fall. Um, however, there's significantly less reporting of those results. Um, and it could be that schools are just feeling overwhelmed and they don't have the time or energy to report all the results or to, um, to even administer the, the tests. Um, so, we, we do have more work to do in this testing space um, and uh, appreciate any partnership on this. Thank you. When you track, when you test the students and they come up positive, do you take it a step further and test the household to see if there was transmission? So what would happen is if someone tested positive, then in as part of case investigation and contact tracing, their household, um, their household contacts would be considered close contacts and would be notified um, and would be asked to quarantine. So while um, there's not routine testing across the state of all close contacts, it's certainly something that's recommended. So if you're notified that you've been a close contact, especially if it's someone living in your household, um, while there's no requirement that you test, there's certainly uh, a recommendation that you quarantine and test. Okay, I just think that data would be helpful um, as far as 
we know that uh, student A tested positive and they're asymptomatic and we're seeing that their household was also, you know, also tested positive. Yep. It, it yeah. certainly would be um, fantastic if we had, um, you know, um, that testing, if it happened all the time, but unfortunately it doesn't happen all the time. Thanks so much. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you, Ms. Tilly. Uh, question from Ms. Lipton. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that I understood the um, answer to your question. So the uh, after the pilot studies that you mentioned, or the pilot programs regarding um, the testing of the athletes before they played in the uh, championship, uh, the idea of, um, I think what's termed test to stay or something like that, I think that's sort of the general term test to stay or something, that is voluntary on the part of school districts currently. And um, okay, so it's 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 some. And if, if a school district did opt to do that, um, what sort of impediments um, are you are you seeing? In other words, once the school district decides to to implement this test to stay plan. Um, what sort of uh, what sort of processes do they need to go through in order to complete it? Would it Fantastic. be just getting the getting the materials or I, I'm just unclear if, if a district wanted to um, implement that since it's voluntary? Um, I think that's an excellent question. Um, I'm happy to talk through how the process works. So while there's nothing mandated at the state level, different counties and different school districts have their own um, policies in place. The state is supplying the testing materials. So right now we're supplying um, a large number of antigen tests to school districts and to counties that are interested. So what this means is most of them are um, the Abbott um, Binax test, which I'm not sure if you've seen before, but it's just a little card. And because schools um, have done this in the spring, a lot of them have worked out what the requirements are. So a lot of them have staff on hand who know how to administer the tests. They um, have sort of streamlined it so that, you know, students are coming in and doing their own swab. And then there's a staff member who's helping to actually run the card. Um, the other part, so there, part A is running the test and part B is reporting the test result. And um, there seems to be a little bit of difficulty in, um, in getting schools to actually uh, run the tests or, or want to be part of testing. Um, and then the second part is actually reporting the test result. And for that, um, there is an online way of reporting testing. We don't ask for all the individual details of a negative test. It can be aggregate. So, you know, we did 100 tests today and they were all negative, but we do ask for the results of a positive case so that case investigation and contact tracing can be, can be done. And then um, just lastly, do you keep track of those districts that have taken the plunge, if you will, um, to 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 uh, undertake this effort, um, and then are, are parents advised, or is there a way for parents to be advised that their school district is or is not um, undertaking this test to stay uh, protocol? So those things are happening at the local level, and these okay. tests don't just have to be taken, they don't just have to be used as test to stay. You can use the tests um, however you like. So they can be used um, just to offer testing for people who are symptomatic, if that's what they like to do. Um, they can be used in a variety of different ways. Uh, one of those ways is test to stay. And again, it would mean communication between the school and the parents, between the school and the school district. Um, and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services is supplying the testing materials as well as some of our training materials that we developed last spring. So how to run the test, how to enter the data, things like that. Very helpful. Thank you so very much. 
Thank you, Ms. Lipton. Thank you, Ms. Lipton. We have a follow-up question from Dr. Pugh. To, to um, Board Member Lipton and Tilly's quick question, um, and you might have mentioned this, Dr. Bagdasarian, but we do have a lot of districts that are dropping testing altogether. And I, I just had a, a message from a parent earlier this morning um, and, and have gotten others, seen it on Facebook, where so many parents are concerned because they don't find out about an outbreak at the school that their child attends until days later when it shows up in the newspaper or, or on the state's uh, uh, list. Um, so I want to bring uh, that up. Um, and again, it's the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services that could help with some of that by helping to uh, push forward uh, the testing mandates. And I, and, and I get it. You know, people are thinking that if they don't test, then maybe their school won't be shut down because it won't be a positive test. But then what happens when people get sick and they end up in the hospital and they take it home to their family? So uh, that's, a, that's a problem. Um, and so I just, I just wanna bring that up and I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, again, what great questions um, today. Thank you so much for asking these. Um, yes, I think there is some reluctance to test because if you don't test then you don't know, so then there's no case. Um, but one of the big um, take home messages from all of the testing programs that we've been working with over the last year is that if you test early, you're actually avoiding those exposures. So if you're testing early, one individual may need to stay home and isolate, which is of course keeping you know, their friends and family safe, but also you don't end up with class exposures. So then you don't have um, you know, large scale quarantines, large scale outbreaks, school shutting down and things like that. Um, and that's really the reason why this type of testing and testing of people who are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic is so important. You run a card, you get the results back in 10 minutes and you can take action right there and then. Um, so yes, I will continue to advocate for testing because um, it's been a great tool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pugh. Uh, Mr. McMillan. I, I just wanted to uh, make sure, as I understand it, if a parent or grandparent is at home and a child goes to school and may come home, if they're concerned about, you know, maybe they have uh, pre-existing conditions or, or underlying conditions, uh, vaccines are available, is that correct for them? That is correct, but as we know, um, no vaccine is 100% efficacious, but excellent point, and yes, absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? We are at 1015. I'm looking around, looking around. I'll just, and just one more, one more. Dr. Pugh, <laughs> the benediction, truly the benediction. Um, you know, there, there was the, the, um, there are districts who are just totally pulling off of, of any type of mitigation because there's confusion as to, uh, or, or they're stating that there is confusion as to um, what legislation currently states. And again, um, the, the best thing for this would be for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to help with testing, to help with masks uh, and articulating that, that very clearly. Um, and so I'll just put that out there. And again, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to say to that. Um, Dr. Pugh, I just want to thank you for your advocacy and um, thank, thank you to everyone on this call um, for this um, chance to have dialogue on this very important topic. Um, really appreciate you all. Dr. Bagdasarian, we appreciate your leadership and partnership. Uh, we wish you well. Thank you so much. Thank you. For the next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is presentation on Western Upper Peninsula programs and challenges. Last month, I had the privilege of visiting schools in the Western UP. I learned a lot and met many hardworking, thoughtful, intelligent educators and made some new friends as well. Among them are two superintendents who are here to share insight on the educational programs and challenges in the Western UP. This is an informational presentation. No board action is required. We welcome our presenters, Mr. Alan Tupo, Superintendent of 
Gogebic Antonagan Intermediate School District, and Mr. Jim Raudiola, Superintendent of Copper Country Intermediate School District. There will be a PowerPoint uh, video presentation. Gentlemen, welcome. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us, um, and thank you to the State Board um, for being doing the work that you do, and Dr. Rice for visiting the Copper Country. I know it was very well received. Uh, the kids had a blast, and I think the State Superintendent had fun also. So thanks for having us here. All right, so we are just going to share a little bit of who we are and, and kind of what we do. Um, but keep in mind, it's just a small piece of, of what happens in, in some of the local schools um, in the Copper Country. So we're going to share some pictures of kids and some of the different programming that we do, and hopefully to give you a picture of, of what we have going on. Um, so as far as the Copper Country Intermediate School District, uh, we serve about 6,336 kids K-12. Um, it includes 14 districts. And uh, recently, we added a charter school that started last September, and that's, that's included as one of the 14. Um, 873 teachers and support staff, uh, that does not include anything that would be privatized, such as busing and whatnot. Um, as far as economically disadvantaged, it ranges anywhere from 26 to 59 percent. Uh, most of the schools falling above 50 percent uh, with the free and reduced uh, lunch and socially or economically disadvantaged. Covers about 2,500 square miles. So to put that in perspective, our my northernmost school at the tip of the Upper Peninsula, to get from that district to my school that's furthest to the south is about a two-hour drive, you know, to go from point A to point B. So there's a lot of distance that's covered uh, between districts in this area. And, you know, obviously our part of what we do is to cultivate relationships and explore possibilities um, and create opportunities for our students and communities. And who we serve? Students. I mean, uh, everything that we do, whether it's at the CCISD level uh, or the local districts, it's, we, we put kids first and we try to do the best so we can provide the best education for them, whether, whether it's a student of high needs or a student uh, that's, that needs gifted and talented. I'll echo what Superintendent Raudiola uh, said about Dr. Rice's visit to the Western UP. Um, we enjoyed having him there and um, hope that uh, he found his time with us at the GOISD um, enjoyable and, and informative. So in the Gogibic Antonagan ISD, uh, we're a smaller ISD. We serve 2,121 students in, in grades K through 12. We have uh, six local school districts, and we span um, Gogebic and Ontonagon counties and a small portion of Houghton County. Um, something unique about us, we're the, uh, we're the only ISD in the state that is divided into two time zones, which can make uh, meetings and scheduling and, and a lot of different things uh, that, that pertain to education uh, challenging. Uh, we cover a total of 5,217 square miles, um, and our economically disadvantaged um, student percentages range from 58% to um, close to 80%. As a result, all of our districts provide uh, free breakfast and lunch to every student. Um, we have a lot of community organizations that help with uh, supplemental uh, backpack programs and, and other supports for families as well. And we work hard at the GOISD to uh, build partnerships with our local districts and, and communities to lead, support, and enrich uh, the education that students receive. So um, Superintendent Raudiola and I are excited to be here today uh, to share with you um, the challenges, opportunities, and successes that districts in our two ISDs have experienced. And foremost among those challenges that our districts experience um, is the acute teacher shortage that we're um, experiencing as a state right now. Um, in both of our ISDs, we have a higher than normal number of um, teachers in classrooms right now that are non-certified. They're on um, permits and waivers uh, to get us through the school year. 
Um, among the reasons for that uh, is that it's difficult to recruit um, to our region. Um, geography I've uh, listed on here is a challenge. We're remote. Um, you know, we, we're, we're, closer, we're closer to um, Madison, Wisconsin than we are to Lansing, Michigan in, in our region. Um, we have high turnover rates among uh, teachers in, in our local districts. Um, and there are some licensure reciprocity challenges that, that we face um, as border ISDs. Um, another challenge that, that we face um, is access to services. And, you know, as a result of, of what we're seeing uh, with student experiences from the pandemic, we're seeing a, a higher than um, normal uh, demand for student mental health services right now. Um, 31N funding has helped with that, um, but we still do not have a large number of private providers who can supplement those services. And finally, geography is a challenge. This uh, challenges everything that, you do, that we do. You heard Superintendent Rodiola say that it takes him a better part of two hours to travel from one point to the other in his ISD. Um, it's similar for, for me in the geo ISD. You know, part of what, what we try to do as local schools, and a lot has gotten dumped on our plates over the years as far as what's expected from educators, is educating the whole child. You know, and I don't disagree. We need to educate the whole child. That includes the academic, the social, emotional, and physical. And one of the things that we implemented uh, over the last couple of years, we, we partnered with the Portage Health Foundation, and they offered what's called Capturing Kids' Hearts to any local district that wanted to participate, they will fully fund that. And it's, the thought is to try to address some of the social emotional learning and, and trauma that, that kids are facing. And if, if we, as all the local districts, can speak the same language, that helps. When the, when the CCISD staff goes into a school, um, it helps that we can speak the language that, that the districts are using. So with the Copper Country Intermediate School District, um, saying who matters, and I addressed this a little bit earlier, but obviously it's the kids that matter. Because these kids, as they're coming forward, they're the next generation of folks that they'll be taking care of us. They, they will be uh, transitioning into the job force, uh, whether it's healthcare, whether it's becoming educators, engineers, uh, race car drivers, whatever that is. But kids matter, you know. So every one of us in this room we're here because we care about kids. We're advocates for children. You know, and, and this, this young lady with the glasses on the right-hand side of the screen there, that's my, that's my baby girl. That's Navy. <laughs> she is five. Uh, she was so happy to get glasses so she could go to kindergarten. Uh, and, and I'm certain that those of you who have children, when you send your, your baby off to kindergarten, there's this, this certain piece of anxiety. Mm -hmm in your stomach. You're sending your baby on the big yellow school bus, if, if you have busing in your district, to who could be a complete stranger, and you're essentially asking them to keep them safe, take care of their needs when they skin their knees, and to educate them. You know, and it's a huge responsibility that we're putting on, on our educators. And it's absolutely paramount that we get the right people in the right places, that we have people that are certified that we have people that are just genuinely good and they care and they're going to take care of, of our children. You know, and, and I don't take that responsibility lightly. And I tell our staff every year that this is an awesome responsibility upon your shoulders. You know, don't mess it up. Our kids <laughs> deserve the best. And, and we deserve uh, to have people in classrooms that can take care of this need. So whether you're a five-year-old going into kindergarten or a middle schooler doing some uh, patriotic sidewalk artwork on the sidewalk, or your high school kids in a robotics engineering class. They're all our kids, and they're all on uh, chasing their dreams. Part of what we do at the CCISD level, for the ISD levels, is offer auto tech. Uh, we were, I shouldn't say just auto tech, but part of the career in technical education, uh, one of the components is auto tech. We were fortunate a number of years back that the community supported a millage so we could develop a CTE program. So uh, 
Um, we've developed something that's growing. I'll say it's the infancy stage. We're, we're still we're still in the growing phase, but um, we have partnered with the local colleges and different community members, manufacturing um, folks to give kids opportunity, to give students opportunities. Um, and one of the programs that we offer is AutoTech, and this is uh, Xander Worm, and I'll let him give his testimonial. I actually want to go into automotive engineering um, at GM, so I wanted to get a practical experience to go with the theoretical. The biggest benefit would probably just be the fact that I'm actually learning uh, a lot more time management than I thought it would, time management and soft skills, as well as obviously you know automotive knowledge. When I leave high school, first of all, I want to get my um, master's in mechanical engineering from Michigan Tech, and then I want to, to go to GM uh, to eventually, hopefully, be chief engineer of Corvette. So he has high aspirations, and I don't know if, if we'll get a Corvette out of the deal, but we will try. Um, some of the challenges that we do face with the CTE classes um, are finding certified teachers, finding people that want to come out of industry and, and work with kids because we're really asking them to take a pay cut. I mean, what they can make in industry and then to come into education, it's a substantial pay decrease for these folks, you know, so it's a continual challenge uh, to try to put an instructor in front of them and, and we've had to get really creative uh, being flexible to make it happen. Nurses Aid is also another one of the programs that is offered under CTE and this is Madeline Ball. I would definitely say that taking this class during my senior year in 2017 helped influence my entire like nursing school because it all starts with that foundation of skills and so being able to already kind of have those I was able to get a better grip on it when I actually entered nursing school. Another program that's offered as part of Career Tech is welding. Uh, this has been a very popular class. This class fills up very quickly with both uh, males and females. Um, the young lady at the right of the screen there that's, that's welding, um, she is now at uh, AWI uh, as a senior, she, she didn't really know what she wanted to do, and somebody said, hey, how about welding? She's like, I'll give it a try. So she went through the class, loves it, um, was able to land um, a dirty job scholarship. I don't know there's a scholarship that, that you can apply through. So she has a full ride to AWI to pursue welding, and she's just absolutely knocking it out of the park. And this is something that she would not have even explored had, not, had she not been pushed or presented the opportunity. So uh, it's just, it's really, it's heartwarming to see when communities are willing to come together to provide opportunities for kids, and it helps all of us. Here's another um, thing that uh, we've done at some of the local schools, and they're called core boards, and I don't know if you're familiar with these or not, but essentially they're a communication board for the students who are nonverbal, and uh, somebody approached our constructions class as part of CT if, if we could build a core board for one of the local schools and we said sure you know give us a, a diagram of what needs to happen so that's what we did this is at Hancock Elementary Barkell Elementary um, and it's allowed the kids who ever struggle with communication to be able to communicate with their peers or their teachers now when the other districts saw what was going on they all want one of these now so we're, we're in the process of putting core boards at all of our local schools it's, it's a really neat thing to observe and then reading to schools, obviously liter <laughs> reading to students, literacy essentials, vitally important to kids. Um, it's, a, it's amazing to me to see the tools that we're giving to my younger children versus the tools that my older children didn't have access to. And it's not that we were doing a bad job as educators, it's just we didn't know what we didn't know. You know, so it, it's, it's so important to provide these kindergarten, this even preschool, preschool, kindergarten, first, second grade teachers with the tools that they need so they can teach the kids. So then the kids in turn have the tools to go on and, and become fluent readers uh, because reading truly is the foundation uh, to being successful as they move into their careers. So we have a picture of Dr. Rice here uh, reading to a first grade class. They were tickled pink. And we also have uh, a fourth grader here reading to some younger students. Um, just like the peer-to-peer -peer type programming. We also partner with local organizations. This was with the health department, but we do what's called uh, Cooking with Kids. 
to try to take some of what the kids learn in the classroom, whether it's a math class or science class, uh, whether they're working in the garden, and, and actually have them do a hands-on activity as part of our STEAM education. We should make an apple pie, that would be so good. You know, how often do kids get to use paring knives in school, but it's a skill. It's a skill, and we haven't, you know, nobody's cut themselves, nobody's lost any fingers, so uh, it's, it's been well received. Um, just a little snippet, when Dr. Rice was in the Copper Country, um, he was in a, at one of our school gardens, and these were his tour guides uh, for the day. And then also part of that same garden tour, um, Dr. Rice was with a kindergarten class, and they were showing him the greenhouse and just talking of different things that they were doing as part of their LSSI, which is the Lake Superior Stewardship Initiative, and um, STEAM education. And finally, um, this is a, a picture of the robotics class at, at Dollar Bay High School. And Matt Zimmer, he's the guy in the, the blue shirt there, pointing out, uh, showing Dr. Rice about the robotics class. Um, he received the MASB Education Excellence Award um, a number of years back for a project that Dollar Bay High School did uh, for the National Park Service for the Great Lakes. So essentially what this class did is they, they built a robot that can, they go and they find the invasive species, the zebra mussels in the Great Lakes. So they can come up with a plan as far as like how to not only locate them, but, but how can we try to eliminate some of that so we can protect the Great Lakes. So um, they went out to the big island in the middle of Lake Superior, Isle Royale, and, and actually they run their robot around there to try to assist with the Park Service and uh, the National Park. So kind of a, it's a real world solution to a problem. And, and the kids actually get to have a hands-on approach. So it, it's just neat to see kids giving the opportunity and the, the toolkits it's amazing the problems that they can solve, and, and we're all a part of it by, by providing uh, the teachers and, and the tools that our teachers need to pass on to the kids. All right. We're going to move a little further south from the Copper Country to the Gogebic Antonagan ISD. Um, and the reason we're all here today is because we believe in educating children um, in every way possible. Uh, meeting, them, meeting them where they're at and taking them a little further um, down their, their um, educational pathway. And um, every child matters and they deserve the best that, that we can give them. Um, in the GOISD, uh, we work uh, collaboratively with uh, a lot of different organizations um, not only our local district partners, but, but with uh, community service organizations as well um, to collaboratively implement um, the um, early literacy essentials. Um, our reading and literacy coaches are, are in the classrooms with the teachers, um, working alongside them. Um, and our, our local districts work collaboratively with their communities to um, enhance, uh, for example, classroom libraries with current and more, more diverse literature. Um, an exciting example of uh, the collaboration that took place with um, the Early Literacy Initiative uh, this past summer was uh, a series of book walks that our Great Start Collaborative um, developed along with um, our uh, reading and literacy coaches. And on the next slide, you'll see a, a little guy get pretty excited um, about uh, his adventure on one of the book walks. <laughs> what do you think it says? Mama, I thought this was holy cinnamon and one night. I read it? <laughs> <laughs> I read it? <laughs> one of my favorite videos uh, of the last month that I've seen. Um, we believe in educating every child. 
and uh, recently uh, students in our learning centers throughout the GOISD in, in our programs and in our local districts um, had the opportunity to um, experience bike riding, some of them for the first time, um, because of uh, various disabilities um, that they, they experience in their lives. This is a key partnership that we have with a couple of uh, disability advocacy groups um, in the Upper Peninsula. It was a tremendous experience for these kids. Um, the GOISD partners with uh, local districts to enhance uh, instructional technology. Um, and, and we were able to, in the, in the most recent uh, couple of years, to use some grant funding to purchase some virtual reality kits for uh, students um, so that they could have a, a more diverse and enriching uh, educational experience. Uh, again, uh, the limitations of geography and, and the distances that, that are required to travel uh, sometimes limit the experiences that kids have. So we've been working very collaboratively with our, our local districts to try to find a way to give them um, these uh, different learning opportunities. This is a kindergarten class in, uh, in Bessemer. Mm -hmm. One of the initiatives that we're extremely excited about in the GOISD is our Fab Lab initiative. Um, and this, this began about three years ago, uh, again, as a result of leveraging some grant funding um, to provide each district that wants one in, in the GOISD uh, with a Fab Lab. And a typical Fab Lab will have uh, a series of 3D printers, some laser engravers, um, routers, uh, vinyl cutters, uh, stem and steam kits, and a couple of them have plasma cutters. And uh, these labs are available uh, to be used by students in grades K through 12. So just like you saw them using paring knives in the uh, steam and stem activity in, in Superintendent Raudiola's portion of the presentation, um, all kids of all ages can get into these labs and learn, uh, learn creativity, um, design and develop a project, and, and actually see it uh, through to uh, production. And a unique feature of uh, the fab labs in our region is that um, students who learn to use the equipment during the school day have the opportunity to work with community members who come in after school and uh, want to learn a new skill. So there's been some great community partnering uh, that has taken place um, through the Fab Lab project. As I had mentioned uh, earlier in, in my, present, my part of the presentation, um, access to mental health supports is, is a challenge. Um, Superintendent Raudiola mentioned the Capturing Kids Hearts um, project in the Copper Country ISD. In the Gogebic Antonagan ISD, um, we've been implementing a program known as the Miss Kendra Project. It's a trauma-informed approach to working with uh, children um, of, of all ages. Right now, we've been introducing it in kindergarten through grades, uh, through grade five in, in our elementary schools. And um, this is a, a video from the Wakefield Marinesco uh, kindergarten classroom. They always remember that they are strong. And this is a, a video from a first grade classroom at the, at the Wakefield Marinesco School. No child should be punched or kicked. No child should be punched or kicked. No child should be left alone for a long time. No child should be left alone for a long time. No child should be hungry for a long time. No child should be hungry for a long time. No child should be bullied or told they're no good. No child should be bullied or told they're no good. And so because of the uh, the challenges in, 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 in finding providers, we've tackled uh, some of the mental health uh, and SEL um, challenges with a whole classroom approach. Um, and our providers have, have done uh, great work with that. 
Uh, the GOISD operates uh, the Great Start Readiness Program, GSRP, in several of our local districts. And access to um, early childhood education, uh, whether it's um, provided by the school district or provided through private um, uh, daycare providers is, is a scarcity in our region. Um, this school year, uh, for the first time since GSRP was introduced in the GOISD, we came very close to not being able to open uh, the program because of a shortage of uh, um, teachers who were properly certified for that program. Um, we were um, almost, almost uh, at the stroke of midnight able to find um, two individuals who stepped forward and, and were interested in uh, becoming um, certified temporarily to, to work in those classrooms. Um, as Superintendent Raudiola mentioned in his presentation, career and technical education um, is growing uh, in the GOISD as well. And it's enhanced through multiple industry partnerships. Um, we partner heavily with um, the community college in Ironwood, we'll give it community college, um, with Lakeshore, with Ironwood Plastics, Burton Industries, um, who are all willing to allow our students to have some on, on the job, on site experiences in addition to um, their classroom experience. Um, <laughs> recently, uh, students, um, as kind of a, a fun, fun activity coinciding with Halloween, visited an emergency room, I mean an operating room at Aspirus Hospital in Ironwood, learned about infection control and surgical procedures, and then got to perform a pumpkinectomy. <laughs> the pumpkins survived. Um, you know, an example of, of the challenges geographically and, and in terms of staff is that in, in CNA, for example, our certified nursing assistant instructor travels 160 miles a day from site to site um, to uh, provide instruction for students in that program. Our welding instructors travel about 110 miles a day to do the same thing. So um, they're, they're extremely dedicated. We're very fortunate to have them, um, and they do a fantastic job for our kids. So uh, school or education, school looks very different than it, it did probably when you and I went through. Uh, it, the COVID pandemic has challenged the way that we deliver education to students. And I think in a good way though, mm -hmm. it's caused us to rethink, retool and refocus. I mean, we certainly have a challenge ahead of us it, it, as far as uh, teacher shortages and whatnot. And, and we're not the only industry that, that's suffering with with trying to find employees, um, but we have a good, op a great opportunity in front of us to make it right for kids. You know, but it's going to take all of us working together to make that happen. And and although uh, you know, there's many sleepless nights sometimes wondering, am I going to be able to put a certified individual in front of a class? Mm -hmm. We've been able to make it work, but it feels like as as time goes on, it, it's getting harder and harder to make that happen for kids. So um, the time is ripe. I guess for us to explore some options and, and, and part of the issue what we're facing in the, the UP is Northern, Northern Michigan University is essentially the, the teacher college that's supplying the whole UP. Well, mm -hmm. that's a pretty heavy burden on them and it's a challenge for us then to try to go after these folks that are graduating from Northern and they're not all Upper Peninsula um, college students, they're from all over the nation, you know, and they may not even want to stay in Michigan, you know, so um, we have to find a solution to not only provide more teachers, but give give access to folks so they can actually attend a teaching college when they might not have to, you know, travel 500 or 1,000 miles to do so. Um, so the choice is ours, you know, and you'll notice there's a picture of a dog here laying on the floor, but there's therapy dogs in schools now, you know, who would have thought? But they've been a great, a great introduction to schools for the kids that need it, to calm the kids down and, and deal with some of the trauma pieces. Uh, we do fire safety, we do hunter safety uh, to teach kids about you know, not only the environment and the natural environment, but how to safely handle um, hunting equipment, um, our CTE classes, go out and find community projects and, and the picture 
on the bottom there, although it's hard to see, is an anchor that they made for the Houghton County Marina. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a dedication. I don't know how many years uh, Marina had been open, but the kids had made an anchor as part of the dedication ceremony. And the entire county was there as a countywide picnic. And they invited our students and anybody that had helped with the project to join the picnic. And, and they just had a little ceremony. So it was, it was neat for the kids to be able to, to be recognized, but also realize that what they're doing is making an impact on communities. And then at the top of the screen there, the, the students in their caps and gowns, we still graduate kids. It's just their path looks a little bit different than it might have when you and I went through. So I appreciate the opportunity that you presented to us to have us here today. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing. It's hard work, but we're willing to stand shoulder to shoulder and do anything we can to assist you in your quest also. So thank you. Thank you very much. Really okay. appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you, Superintendent. Board members, any questions or comments? Uh, Ms. Snyder. I just, something stuck out that you said, and then I have a couple of questions, but when you said when communities come together to create and offer opportunities, that's just sort of really a foundation to uh, what it means to educate kids and, and to be present in the community that way. So I, I think that's something I'll carry with me. But um, two other questions. So you said the Fab Lab with the 3D printers, what do you guys use that? What do you find kids using that for? Well, it's interesting. Um, in, in one of the district, well, it, I'll, I'll use Wakefield as an example because they're most recent to uh, implement this. Um, there are some students who are developing uh, student industries right now within the school. And so currently they're um, making uh, Christmas ornaments. Uh, community members can um, purchase online. Uh, they uh, can select from a variety of options. And then uh, the school, uh, the students will produce um, and, and, and sell that to uh, the communities. Um, there are um, other examples in another district um, where they've used the 3D printers to make manipulatives mm -hmm. for elementary classrooms. So counting tiles and, and things like that. So um, some of it is, is produced for the community. Some of it is produced for use within the school. It gives the kids an opportunity to engage in um, the design and engineering and manufacturing um, of, of uh, the product, which involves um, communication, um, working collaboratively, um, and all of the uh, academic skills that they would learn um, in, a, in a formalized general education classroom. That's really awesome because I had visited Stockbridge, I think it was probably three years ago, they're making prosthetics with mm -hmm. their 3D printers, but you're, you're right on point with the idea this is engineering. Mm -hmm. This is what engineering students from top universities across the country are using 3D printers. So these kids will already have, you know, base level experience and hands-on with something like that. It's very cool. That's certainly our hope. <laughs> so there was a lot in the presentation, but I just am curious about um, one thing. Um, through the pandemic, there's obviously been a learning loss for every child on some level. So I'm just curious about, you know, do you guys have, you know, conversation, ongoing conversations about maybe a plan for that or not necessarily new initiatives or just what is your thought process around that for your area and what do you hope to do? I'll go first. I certainly can. So we, I mean, to your point, obviously there was learning loss. But the learning loss we experienced in the Upper Peninsula is different than the learning loss that may have occurred in other parts of the state. So to your point, we were out for that first year of the pandemic. I think we shut down mid-March, early March. Mm -hmm. So we were out of school from March until that following September. Now, we did online learning. And uh, one of the roadblocks that we ran into, even though we're, you know, we were one-to-one -one in, in many districts, we didn't have the infrastructure in place so the kids had the internet at home. There was a lot of students who didn't have access to, we can give you the computer, but if, if you can't connect it to anything, it, it's almost useless. So we really struggled, or we realized how, how much of a problem we actually had as far as that delivery from that March, you know, till the school year had ended. Um, so we reverted to, you know, opening um, 
links and whatnot up in the school parking lot so parents could bring their kids and, and do school work in the car and whatnot, sent packets home. And we addressed that short period of time. But we also knew that if we were going to have to go into the following school year and do the same thing, this was gonna have a huge impact on kids just because of the limitations we had there. Mm -hmm. So we were fortunate. I feel like we, we dodged it, meaning our kids came back to school that following September. There was a pause. I think our, our kids were out of school for a two week period of time last school year, but we had kids in seats for the majority of the school year. So although we saw a dip in some of our scores, our Acadian scores and whatnot, I don't think we saw as great of a dip as other parts of the state may have experienced. Now what's interesting is um, I just had a conversation with a principal a couple of weeks back. They had a class through last school year of let's say 20 kids where all 20 kids were present from the start of September minus the two weeks that everybody was off but then for the rest of the school year um, nobody was quarantined, nobody you know, chose to homeschool or do virtual. And the scores that they're seeing from that class, I, I think she told me uh, was like 89%. They, were, they scored like 89% on their, their beginning of the year Acadians testing. So obviously having kids in seats makes a difference because that 89%, we're comparing that to let's say 60% for the kids that hadn't been there or the kids that were pulled in and out. So, it's hard to come up with a definitive plan of like how are we going to address this. But I also feel like we we were, our kids were very lucky. They got to come to a school face to face if they chose to. Some parents chose to keep their kids home, but the, the buildings were open, so. Right, thank you. Thank you very much and thank you, Ms. Snyder. Ms. Lipton, a question. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just curious, the department um, has been uh, rolling out a program known as Grow Your Own in order to um, sort of alleviate some of the teacher shortage challenges. And I'm just curious to know if any of your districts within either of your ISDs have um, sort of partaken or shown interest in a Grow Your Own uh, type of program. Yes. Um, in, in fact, uh, we're, as an ISD, participating in the the Proud Educator uh, program um, that has resulted in um, several teachers coming back to the profession. Um, and uh, we are also uh, aggressively pursuing uh, the Grow Your Own program. Um, you know, uh, in partnership with um, our university partners at, at Northern Michigan University, uh, we're in, in conversation also with um, some of the community colleges in the region uh, as well, in terms of how they can support us in that effort. But we do have a number of uh, paraprofessionals and individuals that we already employ, um, who we've approached, who show promise as, as future educators, and we've encouraged them. That's terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much, Superintendent. Thank you, Ms. Lipton. Mr. Strayhorn, you get the benediction. <laughs> okay, real quick. Great presentation. Thank you for that, gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, the Capture Kids Hearts program that you talked about that's being funded, can you talk a little bit more about that with the social and emotional learning? What exactly that is? So um, it was about almost, I'd say, a half million dollar investment from the Portage Health Foundation. But essentially what uh, school, what we offer to the schools is a two-day training, a start, start training, where a trainer will come in from Capturing Kids Hearts and work with the staff as far as what social emotional learning uh, can look like in your school. And, and it's a very uh, methodical program, so everybody goes through the same uh, sorts of training. Um, but essentially, if, if the core of it, if, if a kid does something wrong or an adult does something wrong, um, there's a set of questions that you ask, you know, like, what are you doing? What are you supposed to be doing? Are you doing it? And then what are you going to do about it? So it, it is, it's, it's kind of a debriefing Sort of a situation where we're, we're asking the same four questions for situations that students may or may, may have gotten into you know and and when you when you look at the last question of what are you going to do about it it's really putting onus back on the individual and you can you can use this with adults as you can use it with kids but it's really causing them to think what is it that i did 
okay, how am I going to correct this? Because no matter how much I would like to correct something, you have to do it from internally. So that's the crux of the program, of getting people to understand that they're a part of, of a solution. Okay, and then real quick, the other, you have, it, I saw the CTE, you know, a phenomenal you know, program going on with that. I saw welding happening with the young lady, which was great. And then I saw also you had a virtual reality kits for young kids. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about merging that virtual reality with the CTE? Because that's... Absolutely. We're just not there yet. <laughs> but, but we're heading in that direction. Okay. All right. Thank you. Then you wouldn't have to cut pumpkins open. Exactly. <laughs> no thank bloody you, knuckles. Thank you, Mr. Strayhorn and Ms. Snyder. Thank you for uh, re-referencing the pumpkinectomy, <laughs> which is uh, one, one more contribution to our vocabulary. I want you to know that the literacy walk was fabulous. Love to see the literacy walk. Um, I'd heard of drop mic moments. I'd never heard of a drop book moment. <laughs> so uh, the Dollar Bay, the SOAR program, was, was really extraordinary, the marine robotics. Uh, piece and um, I got uh, thank you notes as I think I, I shared with you from AJ and Maggie which I thought was really um, which was really sweet um, the um, the Gogebic Amtenagen uh, ISD uh, is represented in um, in MDE uh, Luther Wright uh, one of our former state superintendents is up on the wall outside uh, you have a school, Superintendent Topo, uh, named after uh, Luther Wright in Ironwood, which in Ironwood, is right. how, how cool is, uh, is that? So there is that connection. And I just want to thank you for the collaborative work um, with uh, yourselves and with the other UPISD superintendents on teacher shortage. I will be speaking a little bit more about that in a few minutes. I hope you'll stay and, uh, and hear uh, we appreciate you. We appreciate your service to children. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. If I could get a copy, could I get a copy? Board Member 3, good morning. The next item on the committee, the whole agenda, is the presentation on Michigan's Top 10 Strategic Education Plan. This presentation is an annual review of the plan's goals and associated metrics with appreciation for all the staff members that worked on this presentation, including, but not limited to, Ms. Kelly Carter, Dr. Sean Henneke, Dr. Carnell, uh, Alice Ann Shrewsbury, Mark Howe, Karen Carefoot, Kyle Garant, Dr. Delsa Chapman, Dr. Scott Kenichek, Dr. Paula Daniels, Ms. Leah Breen, uh, Richard Lauer and Pat Sargent, Dr. Brian Piles, Dr. Joe Kroll, Ms. Terry Rink, Dr. Diane Golzinski, Stephanie Willingham, Amy Allen is, and uh, Andy Middlestead. And if I forgot anyone, I do uh, apologize. Ms. Terry Rink as, uh, as well. I do apologize. It was truly a team effort. Board, you are aware that uh, Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan was approved by the State Board of Education, by you, on August 
2020. It represents the work of thousands of people, the ideas of thousands of people across the state. It's a focused direction, clear and concise goals, metrics indicating progress toward those goals. It is the state's strategic education <laughs> plan, and we are committed to providing you regular updates as we have in the last 15 months toward individual goals at SBE meetings. Uh, step on your seatbelt board. We're going to cover a lot of ground in the next 50 minutes. <laughs> Here are the state's uh, top 10 strategic education plan goals. We're going to go goal by goal through this and quickly. The first goal is the expansion of early childhood learning opportunities. And in that regard, we sit tied for first in preschool quality in the nation. At the same time, however, we are 21st in access. Why is that? if we don't fund sufficient slots. <laughs> the good news, though, is that there is a solution to that, and our legislature and governor have negotiated that solution. They did so in the preceding few months. So let's look at preschool uh, piece by piece. You can see the increase in overall funding during the Snyder administration. That's the 110% <laughs> increase. And then the subsequent <clears throat> increase during the Whitmer increase, during the Whitmer administration of 80% again this past summer. The number of funded slots increased first during the Snyder administration, 97% uh, in 1314, and then most recently the move toward universality, 46% uh, increase this past summer. The number of DSRP eligible children served, 57% uh, increase during that 1314 period, a decrease last year as some children, some parents chose to keep their children home, and then a 56% projected increase in the coming three years. Half day per pupil funding has risen to uh, $4,350 per child on a full day basis. That's $8,700 per child. That's the minimum foundation allowance first time in the state that our preschool is funded at the level of our K-12. And that's a victory for those of us who believe that early childhood education is every bit as important as is K-12. So a recap on goal one. We're tied for first in quality in the nation. We're currently 21st in access. But with the recent funding of $168 million in pandemic relief and state funds for preschool, we are going to move that access rating higher over the next three years. This is a function of a rising bipartisan consciousness of the importance of preschool. Let me say it again. This is a function of a rising bipartisan consciousness of the importance of preschool in the state. So to goal two, the improvement of early literacy achievement. Board, you saw these figures in September. I won't belabor them now, but I do feel a need to re-report them nonetheless as part of the entire state strategic education plan review. That our MSTEP results were trending upward pre-pandemic, and that, of course, during the pandemic, as Ms. Snyder mentioned, they did uh, diminish um, to some degree. You can see the ELA third grade proficiency. Again, you can see these uh, by gender. We show them by ethnicity here. And again, you can see the trending up for most groups pre-pandemic, a little bit downward thereafter. And then we show you them in other groups as well, students with and without disabilities, economically disadvantaged versus non-economically disadvantaged, English learners versus non English learners. Mostly the same trend in each case, up pre-pandemic, down uh, in the face of the pandemic. It's going to take time to reascend. But it's important to understand that we present these data disaggregatedly, that is to say group by group, because we believe in the power of all children. We believe the power of, of all 1.4 million of our children. We're responsible for them all. It's important to support and reflect upon how to support all of them. So our NAEP, uh, this is a federal test. There was no NAEP administered last spring. 
the feds decided that there was no way to do uh, proper longitudinal comparisons um, every two years. Last, last spring was considered to, would have been considered to have been sullied data. And so it did not administer the federal uh, NAEP test, notwithstanding the fact that it did not provide us with a waiver for our own state MSTEP results. So what are school districts and departments doing and, and our department doing to boost literacy? Well, the expansion of DSR preschool will absolutely have an impact on literacy results in third and fourth grade. Our diversity in literature, I was so pleased to hear uh, Jim Raudiola and Alan Tulpo talk about the, the power of diversity in literature. We're promoting diverse classroom libraries. We had a February 2021 conference on the power of diversity in literature, 1,900 attendees. It was our best attended conference during the year. We have a four-part virtual conference from October 2021 to July 2022. We had Nikki Giovanni last week keynoting that, uh, that conference. How cool is that for those of you who are fans of ego tripping and other great poems by Nikki Giovanni. We have our letters training grant for our pre-K uh, one and more broadly, our pre-K-3 teachers. We have a federal grant, a competitive grant that we applied to that's helping the department help five high poverty districts, Detroit, Pontiac, Flint, Benton Harbor, and Muskegon Heights. We're producing dyslexia guidance as we speak. We continue to lean into the literacy essentials professional development. A number of our districts have lowered class sizes, at least for the time being, with their additional money in order to help out with literacy. And then we have begun to promote parent education and family literacy. The power of parents as first teachers, the power of engaging our parents as partners in education, so important for literacy results. So our recap, pre-pandemic, almost every student group had made progress on MSTEP. Since the pandemic, there have been declines in reading. Uh, percentages uh, proficient across the state and nation. With additional time in class this year, we believe that both students and staff should make additional progress. Much work is going to need to be done both academically and socio-emotionally. We need to uh, work on this with uh, certainly with a measure of, of urgency, but also with an understanding that this is not simply an academic moment, but it's a social and emotional moment. And I was so pleased to hear my colleagues from the Upper Peninsula weigh into the power of social and emotional learning at this, at this moment. I thought that that was instructive for all of us. So let's go to goal three, the improvement of health, safety, and wellness of all learners. And uh, for just, just a note, you may recall, this is the category that has the widest range of metrics, okay? I'm going to move through these metrics quickly for a host of reasons, not the least of which is there are a number of places where data is expected in the coming six to 12 months. It is not available. We note that in the midst of our presentation throughout. Here we go. So average daily student participation in school breakfast programs, 363,000 breakfasts served across the state. That's down a little bit from 1920. So down a little bit from pre-pandemic. Percent of students who have on-track attendance largely uh, consistent over the last four years since the definitional change, 16-17 to 17-18. The percent of students who've been bullied, we expect new data um, on this coming up in the uh, in the coming year and when we get that board we will be sharing that with you and our uh, community in august of 2022 similarly we expect uh, data on these two metrics coming up in about nine months and once that youth risk behavior survey data is available we will make it available to you notice um, the percent of students who were physically active uh, and the percent of students who use tobacco products. I think, Board, you can recall our debates on what should be included as metrics. 
These data for 2021 will be available in August of 2022 as, uh, as well, and we'll be able to see if there are any change in our trends. The percent of students who have had asthma or who currently have asthma, again, these data, the new data, are expected in August of 2022. And then finally, the percentage of children tested for lead or who had high uh, lead levels. This data is anticipated in the fall of 2022, and we know how important this particular issue is for us, not simply in the state, but across the country. The number of students who receive school mental health and support services. We have one year's worth of data because we ha have not been in this space of children's mental health in the State School Aid Act for long. I'll get to that in a moment, but this is our data. 269,823 children served last school year with school mental health and support services. If you look at our overall child well-being, this is a variety of metrics combined. Uh, this is the Annie E. Casey Foundation, which puts together a kids count metric or series of metrics each year. We're 28 as of 2020. Note that 2021 will be coming in June of 22. Um, school district and department efforts. And there are a number of them. The, the, the first, I think, which is enormously noteworthy, is the tremendous effort uh, of our food service staff across the state who have fed children in very, very complicated and challenging circumstances for uh, almost two years, almost a quarter of a billion meals served since the beginning of the pandemic. Kudos to Dr. Diane Bozinski, her staff in Health and Nutrition Services, and more broadly, the, um, the, the tremendous work of uh, all of our food service employees across the state. We have begun a state social and emotional learning slash children's mental health network. It involves people statewide. We've got an SEL campaign, Children Matter, You Matter, Learn SEL. <coughs> this is widely um, uh, and well received. The Michigan Health Endowment Fund gave us a half million dollars to support SEL communities of practice. And finally, the direct mental health services for children at, uh, at school are noteworthy. You know, we have not been in this space long. I mentioned that earlier. Since the summer of 2018, when the legislature first funded children's mental health in the state school aid act and that was only 30 million dollars in the then new section 31n uh, of the state's fiscal year 2019 budget and by the way 30 million dollars it sounds like a lot but it's 20 dollars per child in the state of michigan but since then there has been a rising bipartisan consciousness of the importance of funding and addressing children's mental health needs in michigan schools so, you know, that, that began pre-pandemic, it accelerated during the pandemic. It's one of the silver linings of an otherwise dark pandemic cloud, but I do think it's worth noting today. Look at the investments that were negotiated between the governor and the state legislature, and kudos to uh, the two for coming together, supporting children's mental health. State investments to hire mental health providers in schools statewide, you can see the 31N funding to which I referred previously. You can also see $240 million, almost a quarter of a billion dollars in new Section 31O funding, which was again negotiated between the governor and the state legislature this summer. It's new for FY22 to hire nurses, guidance counselors, social workers, and school psychologists. In addition, uh, a good chunk of federal ESSER money at the local school district level has been used to support additionally the children's mental health needs that they have seen emerging in part as a function of the pandemic, as a part predating the pandemic. MDE established an education equity fund with CARES Act money. Uh, $7.65 million of that went for competitive grant awards to provide mental health services 
and supports in districts across the state. And I already mentioned the $500,000 MHEF uh, fund uh, grant in order to uh, support the development of SEL in 19 applicant districts across the state. So let's go to the fourth <clears throat> state strategic education plan goal, the expansion of secondary learning opportunities for all children. And uh, board, you may recall that this particular area has six broad programs that we are going to be discussing. And, and again, I'm going to move. I told you to strap on your seat belts. If you haven't strapped them on, this is your, your opportunity in the middle of the ride to get them on. There are going to be six secondary school programs that we are uh, going to be discussing in the next few minutes. CTE, AP, IB, Early Middle College, Dual Enrollment, and Special Education Transition Services. That's role. So total students enrolled in career and technical education programs. You notice this 3% increase pre-pandemic over that four-year period of time pre-pandemic, followed by a 7% decline during the uh, first full year of the pandemic last year. Here you can see those in uh, numeric form. You can see the increase of 4,000 children over that four-year period of time, followed by a 9,000 ch child decrease in 2021. Note, though, that we still served 103,000 children in career and technical education last year. And you heard our friends from the Western UP talk about the importance of career and technical education. Below, we show your, you show you the disaggregated data. This is part of our commitment to share disaggregated data when we have disaggregated data with you, because all children have a value. All children have a worth. We're responsible for all of them. And so to that point, you can see the female-male breakout in CTE. You can see the ethnic breakout by year in CTE. So you can see the increases, for the most part, um, in CTE, followed by the, the decline in 2021. And then students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, and English learners. Now, there's such a thing as, as CTE dabblers, kids who take a CTE course or two. And there are children who, who are CTE program completers. They complete an entire program in CTE. And look what's going on with CTE program completers. This is an indication of the power of CTE viewed not simply from the lens of our educators, but also from the lens of our students and our families. A 42% increase in CTE program completers over a four-year period of time, pre-pandemic, 12% during that first full year of the pandemic. But in raw terms, you saw a 15,000 child increase in the number of CTE completers from 1516 to 1920, followed by a 6,000 kid decline in this past year, still an increase of 24% over that five year period of time. This is showing that our children, our families, our educators believe in the power of, of CTE, believe in the importance of CTE in the state. I'd love to see people write about this story. Here, here's the uh, ethnic breakout uh, of uh, CTE completers. Previously, I showed you the female male breakout down at the bottom. I want to subordinate those numbers. Here's the ethnic breakout of CTE completers. And then here are the number and percent of CTE completers by particular groups, students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, and English learners. And again, you can see for the most part, the pattern is a rise, substantial uh, in the four years pre-pandemic, and then somewhat of a diminution during that first full year last year of the, of the pandemic, still increases across most of the categories in CTE program uh, participation and completion. So number and percent of CTE students who received a high school diploma. Here you can see that the increase in CTE students receiving a high school diploma 
13,000 students over that uh, four-year period of time. Please note that this does not include 2021 data. That data should be available at the beginning of the coming calendar year. And we'll, of course, share that with the board when we have it. But this is powerful because there is a link, and not simply a correlative link, but many of us believe a causal link between CTE participation and likely high school graduation. Why? Because for a number of our young people, participation in a career and technical education program is to connect with a rationale for their participation in school. It is to show their understanding of the relevance of school for them. And once you figure out why you're in school, you are much more likely to do well in school. And that's what's happened for a number of our young people. And this, by the way, has helped us drive graduation rate increases in our state. So here are the ethnic breakout, same uh, ethnic breakout, same, same category. And then students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, and English learners. Again, numbers of young people in CTE who received a high school diploma. All right, let's pivot. Second, secondary school program under this fourth goal, early middle college. You can see a very pronounced increase in early middle college, almost 7,000 students over a five-year period of time, uninterrupted, uninterrupted by the pandemic. 84% increase over five years. You can see the male-female breakout. You can see the breakout by ethnic group, increases in all ethnic groups. You can see the increase in students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, and English learners. So here what you see are the EMC students, the early middle college students. These are children who are in high school and college at once for it. They are in high school and college at once. And important to understand that they are not taking individual courses and in, in college, but rather a program of courses in college. So here you've got the count of EMC students who obtained their high school diploma and earned an EMC outcome um, and the percent that, uh, that did so. Here you see those who obtained their high school diploma but didn't earn an EMC outcome. And you may recall, board, when we were developing these metrics, our board president, uh, Dr. Olbrich, noted that there are young people, they graduate from high school, they don't necessarily finish their early middle college program. It's not because they're not interested in their program, it's because they're going to go on to college and work in that field. So it's not as if they drop out of college, not the point. Rather, it's they've moved on to college in many cases in order to pursue their field or to move into the world of work and pursue that field. So let's look at advanced placement, third area of the secondary school program in this fourth goal area. You can see an increase of 11%, uh, followed by a light decline of 3% in total students enrolled in AP. You can see the, uh, the increases, female versus male. You can see the increases by ethnic group as well. We've got 2021 data that we anticipate in January of 22 board. Here are other groups as well, economically disadvantaged and non-economically disadvantaged participation in, uh, in AP. So AP tests taken, uh, you can see an increase in AP tests taken for three years prior to the beginning of the pandemic when there was a decline of about 5,500 tests taken. And we know that there were some challenges in AP tests taking in that first year of the, of the pandemic. Here are the tests taking and students earning credit. 
um, by ethnic group. International baccalaureate. Board, know that a number of these categories, if you will, compete with one another. Um, that, that is to say that if you're in AP, you may not be in IB or vice versa. If you're in IB, you might not be in early middle college, for example. They tug on one another. There, there's only so much time in Children's Day week, month, year. You may, have, may recall State um, Teacher of the Year, Michigan Teacher of the Year, Kara Lawhey, talking about the, the tugs on children simply of AP courses, let alone early middle college, dual enrollment, international baccalaureate, CTE, and the like. Okay. So you can see here a, a rise initially in, uh, in IB courses, a decline in 1920, 19% percent point, increase over that uh, four-year period of time. Here you can see the number of students enrolled in IB uh, by ethnic group. And here you can see it economically disadvantaged versus non-economically disadvantaged. Dual enrollment, again, dual enrollment is to early middle college as single course in college is to a program of courses into college. Yes, that was one of those analogies that you used to have to do in the SATs. Um, so you can see that dual enrollment increased, but not as steeply from a percentage perspective as early middle college did. Nonetheless, the 11% increase over a four-year period of time up to the beginning of the pandemic. Now let's look at the sixth area um, under this fourth goal of secondary school programming, number and percent of youth ages 16 and above with an IEP who meet the necessary federal reporting requirements. And here, relative to meeting the compliance standard, you can see a, a very robust increase of 14 plus percentage points in four years, percent of students meeting the standard. And then finally, um, same category, but relative to meeting the state determined standard. And you can see a light increase in the percentage of students meeting the standard here. We anticipate 2020 data in May of 22. So as far as the goal four recap, Michigan public schools have made impressive gains in secondary school programming, CTE, AP, IB, early middle college, dual enrollment and transition services pre-pandemic, many of which went unreported or underreported in the media. These gains have slowed in some cases, not in all, but in some cases during the pandemic. So the fifth goal, increase the percentage of all students who graduate from high school. And board, we do not have updated data on this. Those updated data come out, as you may recall, every winter, <clears throat> late January, into February, sometimes early March. So at some point during that six week period of time, we will be sharing um, the 2021 graduation rate data with you. But important to understand that our four-year graduation rates in the state of Michigan have gone up nine of 10 years. That's a big deal. That's a big deal because it's hard to get a lot accomplished if you haven't graduated from high school. And not simply graduated from high school, but moved on and gotten something else in terms of a post-secondary credential. Here you can see those graduation rates by gender. And here you can begin to see them by ethnic group, Asian and Black or African American, Hispanic or Latino, Native American or Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. Two or more races and white. Economically disadvantaged versus non-economically disadvantaged. Yes, socioeconomic status does have an adverse impact um, on uh, student outcomes, all else being equal. That's why all else shouldn't be equal. That's why we should pour into some children more 
because they need more. We'll talk about that a little bit when we get to goal eight. English learners versus non-English learners. And finally, students with disabilities versus students without disabilities. So the recap, nine of the last 10 years, graduation rate increases. Can't get very far if you don't graduate from high school. Secondary school programs have helped increase graduation rates. Kudos to our educators across the state who have driven these graduation rate increases in concert with our students and our families. So what efforts have driven these? Our CELN network, our special education instructional leadership network has helped improve graduation rates for our special, our children with special needs. Focus on inclusion and quality tier one instruction, not segregating out particular children, but working with all needs to the extent possible in those mainstream classrooms. Personal curriculum is available to all students, a fact that seems lost on some. Expansions of the secondary school programs that I mentioned, and finally, Graduation Alliance, which was funded last year by the state legislature. Let's go to the sixth goal area, the increase of the percentage of adults with a post-secondary credential, because not only is it important to graduate from high school, it's also important to get a post-secondary credential, to get a credential after high school. And this is the governor's 60 by 30 goal uh, board. That is to say 60% of adults um, with a post-secondary credential by 2030. That's the governor's goal. We're tremendously supportive of that because we know that young people need not just a high school diploma, but they need beyond a high school diploma. They need more than simply a high school diploma to be successful in life. So these numbers come from the Lumina Foundation. It's a national foundation which focuses on this issue of post-secondary credentialing. And uh, you can see a steady rise in Michigan's percentage here. Kudos to uh, all of those who are helping drive these numbers. Um, an increase in a four-year period of time of 5.7 percentage points. Note that the uh, 2020 data is anticipated in February of 2022. And of course, we'll report to the board when we get that data. Here you can see the differences in 18, 19, in 18 versus 19 in these data, small differences. But these are the categories. When we talk about post-secondary credentialing, we're talking about certificates of achievement and certificates, often earned, not always, but often earned at community colleges. We're talking about associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees, graduate or professional degrees. So what's driving this? Well, school district efforts and department focused efforts of, of a wide range are helping uh, drive these numbers. You can see an increased focus on CTE. We talked about not just the increase in kids taking CTE, but more importantly, the kids digging into a particular program of study, and really working hard to complete a CTE program. Early Middle College, which connects high schools to community colleges, has helped uh, drive this area. Advanced placement has helped. Transition services have helped enormously as our, our young children with disabilities are, uh, are better served as they move out into a, a world of work. The state of Michigan has a number of noteworthy efforts in this uh, regard. Michigan Reconnect, bipartisanly supported scholarship program that pays for individuals to attend an in-district community college tuition free, which provides one-time grants for enrollment in approved training programs. Futures with Frontliners, again, bipartisanly supported, offers essential workers an opportunity to complete high school or community college tuition free. And finally, MCTI, Michigan Career and Technical Institute, which develops customized workforce solutions for businesses and individuals with disabilities and provides an educational center for adults with disabilities in Michigan around career assessment services for exploration of job options. Kudos to our, uh, our governor, state legislature, for their bipartisan work on driving higher numbers 
in this post-secondary credential um, area. We know that businesses need trained employees, and we know that simply a high school diploma is not sufficient training. We need to go beyond the high school diploma. And so these are efforts beyond high school, which have helped drive those post-secondary credential attainment rates. So I'm skipping one board, um, not because I can't count, although there are some questions about that, but rather because in this particular case, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, seven, seems to make better sense than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I think that'll become obvious uh, as I reflect upon goal seven in just a minute. So goal eight is provision of adequate and equitable school funding. And you'll notice here that um, in 2020-2021, pre-K-12 funding in the state of Michigan was $19.4 billion. This does not include non-recurring federal pandemic relief funding. That's important. These are recurring dollars, local, state, and federal, for the purposes of pre-K-12 education in the state of Michigan. So kudos to the governor and the legislature, uh, which together agreed on the following historic investments in public schools, an increase in the minimum foundation allowance to $8,700 per pupil, an increase in Great Start Readiness Program funding by $168 million, the funding that I mentioned earlier of almost a quarter of a billion dollars to help hire uh, helping professionals, school nurses, social workers, counselors, and school psychologists, and almost doubling of the funding for the early on program in the state, provision of $1.67 million to help districts with Grow Your Own programs, which uh, the department has been uh, drum beating around. Thank you, Ms. Lipton, for recognizing that, and thank you, our UP superintendents, for being a part of that important effort. This budget, which was passed this summer by the legislature, signed into law by the governor, negotiated between the executive and the legislative branches, demonstrates a rising bipartisan consciousness that Michigan public schools have been underfunded and require more funding. So let's compare, though, school finance research collaborative funding recommendations and actual 2020-2021 funding. The board may recall that the school finance research collaborative was uh, put out a study in January of 2018. It was the fourth study of what would be six studies in six years that said the same thing. Different children have different costs. Um, all children's needs require funding and require funding fully. That's what the SFRC study showed. That's what six studies in six years have shown. But the SFRC study, the School Finance Research Collaborative study, is really the most substantial study of them all. And so we benchmark board, you may recall, we benchmark our metrics off of the School Finance Research Collaborative study. So let's compare SFRC recommendations to actual 2020-2021 funding. SFRC recommended a base funding back in the day, that is to say three and a half years ago, of $9,590 $9, per student with specific substantial additional weights for particular children, namely students with disabilities, poor children, and English learners. These are young people who absolutely have the ability to self-actualize, as all of our young people do, but require more resources, at least for a period of time in their lives, and sometimes more enduringly, in order to, to arrive at that success, in order to arrive at that self-actualization. SFRC also recommended further exploration of three other areas of school underfunding, transportation, capital, and so-called higher poverty. So again, study January 2018, SFRC recommended a $731 per rider estimate to address transportation costs. That's approximately $430 million. But at the same time, you should realize, board and community, that our total transportation costs, um, not last year, but the year prior, were $860 million. SFRC rightly recommended that we need an additional research study on transportation costs. Why? Because what our Western UP superintendents 
pointed out, is absolutely the case. They are very, very widely dispersed, number one, and their transportation costs per child are far greater than my transportation costs were when I led two urban districts, one in Michigan and one in <coughs> New Jersey. Those transportation costs with the adverse impact of the, their, their dispersion um, within their communities shouldn't harm the education that they can provide their young people. That transportation ought not to eat into the classroom in particular communities that are spread out across the state. So SFRC rightly recommended a research study here. SFRC also recommended a research study around capital because there are districts that are able to raise capital with their uh, tax base and there are others that cannot. And you will notice here that while SFRC put in a placeholder of $400 per student estimate, there are some districts that don't need any support in terms of capital. There are other districts that don't have any ability to raise anything from the perspective of a bond or a sinking fund. And so their general funds are adversely impacted by the need to replace a roof, a boiler, a chiller, or, 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 or. Well, they're going to replace a roof at some point, but the adverse impact is that that takes money out of the classroom. And so we've got to come to grips in some way, shape, or form with the capital needs of a number of districts across the state in uh, Michigan. And SFRC recommended a study in this regard. And then finally, SFRC recommended an additional research study on the added cost of serving uh, so-called higher poverty students. SFRC recommended a weight of 35%, that is to say 35% more than the base funding um, for poor children. But in addition, it recommended an additional weight of 15% for higher poverty children. So there's poor and there's more substantially poor. And you can look at this in a variety of ways. This was a subject of rich debate within the study, and ultimately the study team decided it was too complicated to address within that base study, which was hundreds of pages already, and they, they argued for an additional study. But you can see from our Office of Financial Management team, headed by Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations, Garant, that one way of looking at this is that the additional cost of higher poverty is somewhere between $177 million and $423 million. This can be looked at in many different ways. It is extremely complicated, but what we know is high concentrations of poverty create higher costs, and we absolutely need to bear those costs if we are going to give all of our children the same potential outcomes in, um, in and through our schools. So as far as the summary on goal eight, even with historic state investments in public education this fiscal year, which are noteworthy, which absolutely should, should be the, the, the product of some measure of celebration, I would argue. With the inclusion of capital costs, higher poverty student costs, and transportation costs, Michigan schools continue to be underfunded on a recurring basis of approximately five to seven billion dollars annually. The board, let's pivot to the seventh and in this case, the final goal of the state strategic education plan, the need for an increase in the numbers of certified teachers in areas of shortage. Or you may recall me lamenting that when I came into this position um, two and a quarter years ago, a little bit more, I went and had meetings in the legislature and I was confronted by legislators who absolutely understood that there was a teacher shortage and others who appeared to be in denial that there was a teacher shortage. The good news is there is no longer any denial that on both sides of the aisle, across the legislature, you will hear that there is an acknowledgement of the current teacher shortage. But we need to take that up a step and let's talk about that uh, in, the, in the moment. So there's a teacher shortage in many states across the country. This is a national issue. What factors have exacerbated the shortage in Michigan? Well, one factor is that Michigan ranked 50th of 50, 50th of 50 in total education revenue growth 
inflation adjusted from 1995 to 2015, according to an MSU study. Now, that's not just my, my opinion, although that is my opinion, that's an MSU study. And that, by the way, board, was the fifth of six studies in a six year period of time that concluded the same thing, that we were underfunding Michigan public schools. What additional reasons? So in 2011 particularly, the legislature decreased funding by $470 per student. What was the result? Well, the result was teacher and other staff pay freezes and reductions, teacher and other staff layoffs, higher class sizes, and fewer support staff. Educators were mandated to pay a greater share of health insurance and retirement costs. And then finally, we had the state mandate legislatively for annual evaluations of all educators. That passed in 2009, updated in 2011, with the requirement for use of student growth data, including state tests in teacher ratings and the imposition of consequences for ineffective evaluations. So what did that gestalt of, of efforts do? Well, this is what it did, board. Look at what happened in teacher preparation programs across the state. Look at 2013, 2014, where we had 23,203 young people who either were enrolled in or had completed that year a teacher prep program. But shortly thereafter, the pipeline began to be adversely affected. What exactly happened? What happened was young people who were in the program in 11, 12, and 13, they continued in their teacher prep programs. But the young people who were a little bit younger, considering what programs to go into, began to look at public education differently. Teachers began to look at public education differently and begin to speak about public education differently. The community did as well. And young people started to go into public education less. You see a diminution of those numbers from 23,000 to 14,000 to 10,900 to 9,500. The good news is, board, that in the last few years, we've begun to see a rise in the number of enrollees and completers together. That's the good news. The bad news is, is that we are still about half, just a smidge higher than half of where we were in 2013, 2014. Ford is aware that for many years, we've had a, a, a number of critical shortage areas, CTE, ESL, bilingual education, math, science, special ed and world languages. But who would have thought that in recent years, that this would extend to elementary education, to physical education, to language arts and social studies. Many of us never thought that we would get to a day when we didn't have a wide range of candidates from which to choose at the elementary school level. Gone are those days. So let's look at teacher FTE counts compared to student FTE counts. And board, this is looking at this in terms not simply of quantity, but also diversity. Because we think that we need to look at teacher supply, we need to look at quantity, quality, and diversity, that they are all important. Look at the teacher FTEs. You will see that the percentage of white teachers has gone from 91.8% to 90.8% last year. So in a four year, in a five year period of time, you can see a decrease of one percentage point, a rise of one percentage point in teachers of other ethnicities. When you look at student FTE counts, you will see that our students are 65% white, approximately 35% of other ethnicities. So the relationship between our students of other ethnicities and our teachers of other ethnicities is approximately four to one. It's just under four to one. We believe that our young people should see themselves not only in the literature that they read, but also in their teachers that they experience. And we believe that this is the case for all of our young people, not some of our young people, but all of our young people should see a range of uh, teachers. 
So let's look at this um, by ethnic group in terms of teacher FTE counts. There was recently a report that noted that the number of black or African American teachers in the state had declined. That is true for the period from 2005 to 2015. That is not true for the period 2015 to 2021, where that number has increased. It's increased by more than 600 as a result of very substantial efforts on the part of a number of people, efforts that have begun to um, accelerate in the last year. So again, the number of black or African American teachers declined in the decade between 05 and 15, has increased between 15 and 21. So let's look at this in terms of percent of teachers in each ethnic group. And I'm, I'm not going to belabor this, but I do want to make a, a couple of points here. Notice that among African Americans, 17.5% of our students are black or African American. 6.6% of our teachers are black or African American. That, that uh, percentage certainly needs to be increased from my vantage point. But notice also that it's increased by one percentage point over the last four years. So it's trending now, again, in the right direction. Not to say that we are where we need to be. You can see the ratio between students who are black to teachers who are black of a little bit less than three to one. Remember that the ratio of students of other ethnicities to teachers of other ethnicities was a little bit less than four to one. So in aggregate, this category doing better than many others, not vaguely where it needs to be. Here you can see this category by category because board, we made a commitment to you when we put this state strategic education plan together that we believe that there was a power to disaggregated data, which we are sharing with you today. So with respect specifically to African-American or black teachers, note that uh, we have a partnership with In Demand. In Demand provides black men in Detroit with opportunities to become educators, mentors, and volunteers in their schools and communities. We appreciate that relationship. In addition, there are a number of school district and department efforts around improving quantity, quality, and diversity in our staffing. First and foremost, when we do surveys or when we benefit from surveys of our partners, when uh, Leah Breen, director of the Office of Educator Excellence and her team um, benefit from surveys, uh, what do they find? They find that teachers and would-be teachers regularly cite compensation as the major issue relative to entering and staying in the teaching profession. Not surprising when a teacher in Michigan can make less than $40,000 a year to begin. And that's pre-tax. That's pre-tax, pre-loan. I'm going to keep beating this drum. We need to boost teacher compensation, and we particularly need to do it with early career salaries. We've got an opportunity with new funding, but we have to be very, very careful with that new funding. Why? Because some of that new funding is non-recurring, and you ought not to put recurring expenditures on non-recurring revenue. Non-recurring expenditures, non-recurring revenue, recurring expenditures on recurring revenue. You get into trouble putting non-recurring, um, putting recurring expenditures, recurring uh, obligations on non-recurring revenue. We also need to improve teaching and learning conditions in our schools. And that includes providing more opportunities for our kids to share their voices and their experiences. They are enormously experienced and knowledgeable and they need to be tapped into and they need to be included more substantially in the partnership around how we improve our public schools. The department has advocated along with school districts 
uh, grow your own programs. We are strongly pushing grow your own programs for support staff. You are not what you do. You are what you are capable of becoming. Let me say it again. You are not what you do. You are what you are capable of becoming. And that's not simply with paraprofessionals. It's with custodians. It's with food service employees. It's with bus drivers. Some people have said, well, you know, have you ever seen this happen? Yes. My second shift custodian in my former, former district is now an elementary principal. One of our former bus drivers, an elementary, an, I'm sorry, elementary teacher. One of my former bus drivers, an elementary teacher, former paraprofessional principal. This can happen more than it currently happens, but we have to pour into our support staff in order to encourage them to take that next step. Somebody encouraged everybody in this room to be more. And because they did, we were encouraged to try to become more. And we need to do the same with our support staff in support of our young people. Similarly, we need grow your own programs for students with an interest in exploring and possibly becoming teachers. Each of these two groups board is more diverse than our teacher workforce as a whole. Our student body is more diverse than our, uh, than our uh, teachers as a whole. So to our support staff, to actively uh, inspire, interest, engage, recruit from among those two groups is to work not simply on quantity and quality, but also on diversity as well. So the department established um, uh, a number of, of efforts over the last uh, year or year and a half. The Future Proud Michigan Educator Explore program is a, uh, a students to teachers program. It's a grow your own program around students. We awarded $1.1 million for grow your own implementation grants to 44 school districts, 88 schools in those 44 school districts to encourage an interest in teaching. We've got the Welcome Back Proud Michigan Educator Program. It's been going on for just under a half year. In the spring, we sent tens of thousands of postcards to formerly certificated individuals. 1,100, more than 1,100 formerly certificated individuals provided an email address to be contacted by districts. That's a big deal. 161 districts submitted waiver requests for 228 eligible educators. These numbers move weekly. They move weekly. We are working to create, if you will, a virtual marketplace for teachers, right? In other words, we are reaching out to people who were certificated. Do you have an interest in participating in this marketplace? And we are reaching out to districts and saying, do you have an interest in having conversation with people who used to be certificated? And what we are doing is, to the extent that they have an interest, these districts, in hiring formerly certificated individuals, what are we doing? What we're doing is we're saying, um, we will provide regulatory relief. We will provide you with your certificate with fewer or no professional development hours required for that recertification. We want them back. It's, you know, I hate to, to uh, get campy and start quoting um, old songs but we want you back. And um, we're not too proud to uh, write postcards to, um, to, to get you um, to reconsider your, uh, your career choices. Similarly, um, in October last month, we sent 35,454 or so letters to educators with valid certificates who are currently not teaching in a public school, 1,100 plus provided an email address for contact information. 336 districts across the state are now participating, if you will, in this virtual marketplace for, uh, for educators. We understand that these ideas are not the answer. They are a part of the answer. In fact, I might add that nothing that I've said to, uh, to this point in the presentation, nor anything that I will say subsequently is the single answer. They are all part of a gestalt, all part of a, a set of answers to the teacher shortage. The department a year ago 
lifted the moratorium on alternative certification programs, got 11 applications. Two of those applications we worked with more substantially and ultimately granted alternative certification program status to Detroit Public Schools Community District for the On the Rise Academy program and to New Paradigm for Education's program as well. Note that these are both in the, in the, in the Detroit area, number one. Note that in each case, at least in part, the effort was in increasing not simply quantity, but also diversity in our staff. And I think that this is really important. The DPSCD program got started four months before the new paradigm program. Each of these has begun to work with uh, cohorts, and we anticipate that over the next five years, these are going to provide us with, uh, with some measure of additional um, teachers in the, in the state. I might add, by the way, the DPSCD, of course, is our largest district in the state. New Paradigm for Education is a PSA, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a, an outfit that runs and has run for a number of years, more than two decades, several schools in the Detroit uh, area. So we are agnostic in this particular case when it comes to teacher preparation and development. The reality is, is that all of our young people in all of our schools require good teachers, and that's not simply public, but that's private and parochial as, uh, as well. So the department has also offered special education certification flexibility um, for special education teachers, social work credentials flexibility for social workers who are on the way to becoming school social workers. They may have a bachelor's degree, they may have a master's degree, but not in school social work, but in MSW nonetheless. And uh, because a local school district in ISD has not been able to find a person with an, an MSW specifically in school social work, but have demonstrated their efforts to do so, we grant them some measure of flexibility in that regard. So a lot of efforts around regulatory relief. But that said, board, the fact of the matter is, is that we need an investment here. The fact of the matter is, is that this is a major issue across the state. It's a national problem, yes, but we're not responsible for the national problem. We're responsible for the state problem. And there are a number of, of uh, efforts that our legislature, our executive, um, in, in concert, really need to reflect upon as, uh, as we address this problem. We recommend an investment of 300 to 500 million dollars over the next five years, the beginning of our effort to recruit and retain the requisite, the requisite number of high quality educators for our students. Note that this is a menu of ideas board. Please, please reflect upon that. It is a menu of ideas. There are a number of ideas here. We know that there is not going to be in the next 30 to 60 days a starting of all of these ideas. But we believe that each of these ideas has merit and that over a period of time, each of these ideas deserves consideration as we work to provide the best um, um, and most substantial number of educators, and, and a diverse set of educators for our young people. So in no particular order, we believe additional legislative efforts are needed for each of these areas. Because board, as you are aware, the State Board of Education doesn't allocate funds. The Michigan Department of Education does not allocate funds. Uh, the allocator or appropriator of funds is the Michigan State Legislature. And so we are urging more of that bipartisan effort around this particular issue. So tuition and other expense reimbursement for current college students. We believe that we ought to be supporting people, helping to support people get through programs so that they can help serve our children over the next 20 to 30 years. We believe that there should be some loan forgiveness for current teachers who are working to pay off college loans. If we expect a major commitment from young people, we've got to demonstrate a major commitment to them. 
We believe that scholarships for some small number of high school sen seniors who aspire to and commit to a career in teaching is important. This is done across the country. States as close as Indiana have these programs. We should as well. We believe that we need to revive and strengthen the teacher preparation pipeline in the Upper Peninsula and the Northern Lower. You heard our friends from the Western UP talk about this. They indicated that the, 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 the major driver of teacher preparation in the Upper Peninsula and the Northern Lower is Northern Michigan University. Northern Michigan University and Dean Lubig do a tremendous job what they do. But to expect a single institution um, with, with uh, a little bit of support from other institutions to provide for most of the UP and the Northern Lower is unrealistic. We have to support teacher preparation pipeline in the Upper Peninsula and the Northern Lower. And I'm so appreciative that the UPISD superintendents and other UP leaders want to walk this walk with us. Had a great meeting last week with them, had a great meeting with them in Marquette a month ago, and we need to be about, when we talk about supporting everybody, that's everybody. That's irrespective of what your skin color looks like, what disability you may have, whether you were born somewhere else, whether you speak another language when you come home from, from school, whether you're poor or not, and whether you were born and raised in a geographically isolated or remote area. Every children deserves quality teaching. We believe that we need to improve the mentoring of new teachers in the state with the provision of stipends. We have a mentoring law, but we need to strengthen that teacher mentoring law. We need to ease restrictions on accepting teacher licenses from other states. Some people have said, you know, Department of Education, you need to, you need to work on reciprocity. That's the answer. Uh, it is an answer. Uh, there is no the answer. Just, just to re-underscore re that, there is no the answer, but there is there are a number of answers, and reciprocity is a piece of this. But no, we're already in this. 1,160 out-of-state certificates were issued in 1920. We need to make this easier. But we, in 1920, 27% of our, of our certificates, our teaching certificates, were awarded to out-of-state candidates. Reflect upon that. Here are some additional legislative efforts that need to be considered. The support for entry to the profession for young people, or maybe not so young people, who completed preparation programs but didn't obtain a credential, right? These are, these are the teacher prep equivalents of ABDs, all but dissertations, right? They walked up to their credential, didn't get the credential, didn't go into the profession. We believe that we need to expand eligibility for child care to individuals in teacher preparation programs. If the only thing that's blocking you from, from doing your student teaching is childcare for a semester or a year, it is in the interest of the state to provide you with some childcare for a brief period of time so you can serve children in public schools across the state for the next few decades of your career. And we believe that uh, the consideration should be given for providing tuition reimbursement for the legislative required reading course. We're not quibbling with the, the importance of the course. We simply think that, um, that it ought to be funded uh, by the legislature if it's mandated by the legislature. We believe that we ought to evaluate any programs in this area of recruitment and retention, that there ought to be additional grants to districts to um, work with aspiring students, students that aspire to a career in teaching. We also believe that there should be consideration for stipends to student teachers to help defray living costs during student teaching. It is not easy to make it as a young pe person in a teacher prep program. And everybody does not have a mom, a dad, a grandma, or a grandpa who can fund their living expenses while they um, go through 
uh, particularly the student teaching portion, that last semester or that last year of their teacher prep program. Moreover, if you are a support staff member, life has already begun to happen to you, okay? You are already in the labor force. You are already earning money. Walking away from that money in order to student teach may not be possible. So you may, you may not have the opportunity to pivot. If we help you through that moment, through that semester or through that year, depending upon how long your student teaching uh, is, we can end up accessing a teacher for 20 to 30 years. It seems to me that's worthy of conversation. So, board, there's a rising bipartisan consciousness about the existence of the teacher shortage across the state and country. That's the good news, that there's no argument about whether there's a teacher shortage. There was two years ago. There isn't now. But with this raised consciousness needs to come a raised understanding on both sides of the aisle of the need to help fund efforts to recruit and retain teachers to this hugely important profession. We need to reinvest now. We need to rebuild the teacher profession. That teacher profession was chipped away at over a decade. And it may take a decade to rebuild it, board. We can't build a better past. Some, some people want to lament the past. We're not going to be able to rebuild a past. We're not going to be able to build a better past. But we can build a better future. But we need to go about it right now. So um, with that seeming filibuster ended, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Here. I'll, I'll start. Um, a couple things you left out regarding um, helping with teacher retention would be uh, merit-based so that good teachers uh, are rewarded and bad ones are not. Um, and also, as far as funding, I think you also left out, um, you know, the, the huge increase in administration and overhead that uh, has been occurring. I, you know, I, I doubt you're going to use the word layoff or reduce uh, administrators, but um, certainly, uh, back when I was in the legislature and for many years, there's been advocacy uh, for more money into the classroom, meaning less in overhead. And um, and then finally, you know, I, and I had a lot of questions about some of the other stuff, but it, you've you've gone quite a long time, so I really don't feel like I should go into them, but. Um, you know, I think that if there's an interest in this quote unquote rising bipartisanship, which uh, took a little bit of a tumble last week, uh, there needs to be uh, a, a reduced uh, or elimination of the hostility of uh, many in the education community toward parents. And this hostility um, needs to stop. Uh, I'm glad to see some states pulling out of the NS NSBA. Uh, some state boards are doing that. Um, other school boards are pulling out of MASB, I hope. I hope they all do. Uh, I know that they apologize, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, and then all the other education four-letter uh, uh, acronym education, you know, came and, and rallied behind MASB on, uh, on their warning about all these dangerous parents. The attack on uh, even nationally on the west side of the state is just um, it's outrageous. And so, you know, please don't don't assume you're going to get more funding. I think more as more people pull their kids out of public education due to, you know, this this hostility towards parents, towards the harmful mask, unnecessary and harmful masking and, and who knows, probably vaccine requirements. Uh, no, there's there's not going to be bipartisanship. It's going to be as we saw last week, an overwhelming uh, number of people rising up and saying this is not going to be tolerated. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I, I just want to just want to clarify a couple couple things. Um, Tiffany has indicated, Marilyn, that she's having trouble hearing, and she asked for an unmuting. So, if you can if you can help in that regard, 
um, so that so that our board members at a distance can uh, can hear. Um, just a couple of things. I was not suggesting uh, that there is a rising bipartisanship generally. I was talking about a rising bipartisan consciousness on specific areas, and those specific areas were GSRP preschool number one, where. Um, where the legislature approved $168 million to move to universal preschool for all eligible in the summer, signed into law by the governor, negotiated together between the governor and the legislature. Um, the additional funding of children's mental health of a quarter of a billion dollars uh, negotiated between the governor and the legislature. And then finally, the uh, the historic investment in public education, um, goal uh, goal eight of the state strategic education plan, again negotiated bipartisanly. I, I am under no illusion that that bipartisanship extends to all issues. I was citing three elements of the state's eight state strategic education plan goals, and I could easily have mentioned goal six as well the efforts around 60 by 30 with Michigan Reconnect, Futures for Frontliners, and MCTI. So those are, those are four examples and four of the state's strategic education plan goals of uh, bipartisan uh, work, which I think is noteworthy. The, the, the point about merit pay, I'd like to have some conversation with you about merit pay, actually. Um, merit pay is interesting. I'm unclear that merit pay actually has an effect on the quantity of teachers in a, um, in a market. I do think that there are places where merit pay has merit, and I think it's worthy of, worthy of consideration. Um, other questions or comments by, uh, by board members? Dr. Pugh. And uh, the superintendents just left, but I did want to uh, commend them and, and thank you for, for having them on the agenda. Um, was hoping that they would hear that before they left. Um, I, this is a great report, uh, uh, Dr. Rice. Thank you uh, for this thorough report. Uh, a lot in there. And so I will continue to read through it. The, um, uh, the explanation and the breakdown of where we are with the funding, because we're so excited about uh, the funding that we're seeing. But it is good to make sure that we keep our eye on post uh, the three years of the existence of the funding or however long the funding will go. So this will be very helpful. Um, my questions would be um, just really, well, one one is around the, the teacher shortage, I guess the two around the, the teacher shortage. Uh, you start the report off and you talk about some of the policy um, issues that have driven this issue with, with educators, and, but I didn't really see any um, related uh, recommendations for the, for the um, legislature. And I'm talking about existing teachers because it looks like it was more focused on drawing, attracting new teachers. And just thinking through what are some of the things that we can do to improve the environment and the client for climate for existing teachers uh, and really connecting some of the um, issues that you've seen. That also includes COVID. You know, I think a lot of teachers, um, I know because I hear from them, uh, did not feel that they were, their voice was heard. Um, and that's been going on for some time now, whether we're talking about evaluation, um, accountability, but also, uh, and then the things, the supports and the needs of the children, but also in this climate of of COVID in this world of COVID that we live in, not feeling as though they were they were protected. And so just thinking about what are some of the things that we can maybe add um, to the list of recommendations to whomever, the legislature, whoever we need to be focusing on. The other piece was um, I saw the numbers around educators. Uh, I think it was African-American educators uh, it was African-American educators. There was a report that came out recently and I was asked to give a, um, uh, a response. And really it mirrored some of the things that you had talked about before. 
uh, some of the things they didn't capture. I did talk about what, what some of the proposed activities were, but that wasn't captured in the article. But the article talked about a shortage in uh, African American, a decline in African American teachers, uh, teachers of color. And I don't know if you've, you've seen that report. I have. Okay. But, but uh, and I referred to the report in the presentation. That report, though, uses data from 05 to 15. Okay. So it's okay. really reflecting upon a historic decline followed by, by a rise in the last six years. Okay. And so the rise in the last six years is 660 um, African American uh, teachers. Uh, but prior to that, there was a decline. There's no question. And I'm not by any, by any means saying we are where we need to be. Not my point. And just, um, and I heard you talk about the, 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 the increase and then the decline, um, because of the thought was is that, that uh, where students were relocating and that there was not a uptake of, of uh, educators of color in those areas where, where children were moving out to. So um, we can I can talk more about that later. I'll, I'll look at the study. Yeah, I'd, I'd like that. Okay. I think that there's, that we, we are under no illusions that this represents the waterfront. Um, we, we need a more robust, focused conversation about um, efforts to address recruitment and retention to the point of retention. Voice is huge. There's no question about that. Loan forgiveness is a retention effort, right? If I start at $38,000 a year, chipped away by um, uh, your pre-tax, and then, and then in, I have to pay $500 a month for loan forgiveness, it makes for really an insuperable barrier. So loan forgiveness is an effort at retention. Voice uh, enhancement or, or the involvement of staff, I think, is, is also a retention effort. There have been discussions about scaling the profession, and there's a value to scaling the profession. You have to be careful about scaling the profession to such an extent that you, 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 you rob the classroom of its, uh, of its teachers. So that scaling of the profession has to be in concert with the expansion of the pool of, of teachers. So I can see that though we put forward, you know, a dozen ideas here for consideration, that there are others that are worthy of consideration as well. Um, Leah Porter, I'm delighted that you are jumping into this conversation. Thank you. I just wanted to share, Dr. Pugh, thank you for bringing up the retention of teachers. And I was so excited to see it as part of the idea generation of what is happening with the teacher shortage. Um, right now, teaching in a uh, district, in a building, uh, teachers are exhausted because of the teacher shortage. And not only just the teacher shortage, but the staffing shortages in general that we're feeling across all districts. And it's burning out so many teachers that have a love and investment in education and have a heart for teaching. And my concern is if we're not changing some of those things quickly, that we're going to continue to see teachers leaving the profession as we're transitioning back in from the pandemic. I mean, the stakes have never been higher on teachers and they feel that pressure and they are just burned out beyond belief. I can't tell you the number of meetings I've sat in with leaders across the state of teachers visibly emotional about the stressors that are occurring on a daily basis in their classrooms and uh, just feeling so overwhelmed and not having the support systems in place. And I work in a building that has a very cohesive team of teachers and professionals that work together. And I have seen some of the best teachers I've ever worked with in my career just to their breaking points in terms of the difficulties. And so I'm glad to see those pieces being discussed but it is like a fire burning this second with the teachers that we currently have. And um, I think that conversation is of the most urgent and necessary need, so. Good, thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. Anything else from the board before we uh, break for lunch? Ms. Tilly, a comment. Yes, um, thank you so much for the presentation. I feel like it was very in depth. Um, as far as the teacher shortage, I think all of those were really good ideas. Um, I know that the legislature has changed a law recently um, to allow retired teachers to be able to come in as substitute teachers. I've spoken to retired teachers that would like to come back full time 
and work. I think that we need to um, do more to to allow that to happen, as well as um, I think another big issue for teachers is salary. We're we're putting millions of dollars in to do you know this campaign to attract teachers. What are we doing to make sure that they have the an, an adequate salary? I've spoken to teachers that have two jobs trying to make ends meet just so they can keep doing what they love. Um, so we really need to look at salaries. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kelly, thank you very much. And just just a note, um, it is it is what we lead with and it's what we end with when we talk about um, the the profession. Uh, we believe that the profession has been underfunded. We do believe that the budget uh, approved by the legislature, signed into law by the governor, the, the product of, of bipartisan negotiation, we believe that that budget will begin to help us in this regard. But, but we all know that the profession was chipped away at for a decade, and it is going to take time to rebuild that profession. You do not create teachers, as you know, um, in uh, in six months or a or a year. So it's going to take a number of years of rebuilding, and it's not simply in on the extrinsic side. It's not simply in terms of of, of dollars, although the dollars are hugely important. But it's also in terms of the intrinsic, the conditions within which or around which teachers teach. So thank you, Ms. Tilly. Ms. Lipton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have two just short questions. Um, the first question is, I was curious if you had any um, thoughts or any, um, any explanation for what seems to be just a, just, I was just really interested in this, um, in this trend um, the the one program that did not show a decline um, was the uh, chart you showed re with regard to an increase in early middle college during the pandemic. Um, some of the other uh, parameters that you discussed at that same time showed a pretty much all of them showed a decline, but that one showed a it was a, a slight increase, and I was wondering if you. Um, or anyone on your team had um, a any explanation for why that might be. I just thought that was really, um, that was really interesting. Um, and then the second question I had was with respect to the additional studies um, that you mentioned with regard to transportation, um, uh, special education, um, and I believe uh, impoverished students. Um, is that something that the legislature would need to um, would need to authorize, uh, or is that something that the department could fund um, without going through the legislature? So um, the three additional studies that the School Finance Research Collaborative study recommended were on transportation, capital costs, and um, right. higher poverty students. And to your question, the legislature could fund um, one or more studies in those areas. Uh, philanthropy could fund one or more of those studies. Um, uh, the department could fund um, a, a study, but the department would have to have uh, money for that uh, study. You really have to have not simply uh, the funds for the study, but the expertise to do the study. The, the studies are, are very involved. And, you, you know, just, I don't want to belabor it except to say that there aren't a ton of people who can do this kind of work. Um, there, there, there are a few in the state that I can think of that could, could do this sort of work. And there are a few nationally that could do this sort of work. Um, it's not, it's not easy stuff. So it's, it's money on the front end. It's the inclination to be involved in the, uh, you know, the time to be involved as, uh, as well. 
Um, I, I, will, I will tell you we've had conversation with a, a professor in the state who periodically says that he's going to do one of these studies. And um, I would uh, be delighted if that, uh, if that became a reality. And, and then just, uh, thank you. Um, and then just on the issue of the, if you had any thoughts on the, why there was an increase in the early middle college, or was it just? So, so all of those, any, yeah. So all of those six secondary school programs under the fourth goal of rising secondary school program participation, all of them showed increases pre-pandemic. Some of those increases um, slowed and reversed um, for, for the time period once the pandemic hit. Um, they didn't give up all the gains, but they gave up a portion of the gains from the preceding four years. But all of them over the half decade showed increases from 15, 16 to the current day, every, every single one of them. Early middle college, it seems to me, it's not a single course, it's a set of courses. So you're already in the pipeline. And um, so I think that's a piece of it. You've already invested a couple of years in this effort. So that's one. Two, you're talking about kids who tend to be ramped up um, uh, academically. And, and that helps to sort of weather the, the, the pandemic storm. Um, so I think that there's, there's, a, there's a piece to that. And though they, and I would say that there are many in early middle college that um, have some measure of socioeconomic advantage. Not all, not my point, but a number do. And that helps to weather the, the pandemic storm as, uh, as well. You'll notice that CTE completers um, continued to rise, even though CTE participation dropped off a little bit. It's a little bit like the relationship between dual enrollment, which dipped a little bit, but early middle college, which continued to rise. People who have a more enduring um, commitment to a given entity, early middle college as opposed to dual enrollment, CTE completer status versus CTE single course taking, um, because of that greater um, commitment to, uh, there, there's probably a little bit more stick to uh, in that. That's the, that's the best I can do, Ms. Lipton, at 12.34 in the afternoon. Um, does anybody else care to share? If not, we are adjourned for lunch until 1.20, 1.20.